Hello to everyone out there listening. I'm Nat Eliason, and welcome to Nat Chat, where we're currently focusing on what to do as a college student or recent graduate who feels like they don't fit in the somewhat broken world of grades, classes, and one-size-fits-all careers. In this episode, we have one of my favorite people to talk with, Neil Sony. Neil and I originally connected over Twitter a few years ago, since we'd gone through the same startup incubator together. While he was an undergrad, he started a company called College Zen to help prospective students get matched with current students to get a real feel for the school. That startup didn't work out, but the people he met and the experience he got from it turned into his next few roles, including his most recent work as an innovation consultant for Estee Lauder, and we dig into just what that means during the episode. I wanted to talk to Neil for a few reasons. He's had an extremely varied career during and after college, from starting that first company to leading growth at another to doing this innovation consulting and now starting a beer company of all things. He's also one of the most well-read people I know, and he draws deeply from history, philosophy, and science in his discussions. These can lead to really wide-ranging topics on anything that we talk about, and our catch-ups tend to run about as long as this interview. And he's also really good at testing ideas while maintaining safe alternatives. He was able to try out a number of startup ideas while doing his consulting work, giving him the best of both worlds, a steady income he could rely on, but also the flexible hours he needed to test these ideas. Now that one of those ideas is working out, he's been able to leave with much more security than he would if he were jumping in blind. We covered how he tested those ideas, how he's landed these roles, how he developed the skills he needed, how he chooses what to read, what he did and would have done differently with his college education. And then we dive into philosophy, psychology, science, pr- pretty much everything. Uh, obviously, this is a really long conversation. I didn't want to cut ourselves short and we were covering interesting topics throughout. So I let it keep running. This is sort of an experiment in that sense, then trying out a really long, very in-depth format. Uh, so if you like it or dislike it, be sure to let me know after the episode and be sure to say hi to Neil on Twitter afterwards at the real Neil. That's N-E-I-L-S. And with that, let's welcome Neil to the show. Neil, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for coming on tonight. Thanks, Nat. Really excited for this. Yeah. So we... We originally met via Twitter, right? I think a couple of years ago. Yeah, Twitter, so Alpha Lab, something. Alpha Lab, yeah. We, well, we have like, we're, I feel like we have so many mutual contacts, some of which were after we met, and then a bunch of them were before. We um, actually, we're de- we definitely overlap in social circles a lot. We went to college at the same time for two years, but never knew each other there too, right? Yeah, I, I never met right. you until... Uh, after. Yeah, I think a couple of years after I was already gone and you were, I think, a senior at that time. Yeah, we're kind yeah. of tailored fit. <laughs> uh, okay, so Good old we'll, Alpha Lab days. <laughs> old Alpha Lab days. We'll, we'll come back to all of that. Uh, what I wanted to start off on, because I think this is such a great job title, is what you at least have listed on your LinkedIn is what you do right now, which is external innovation consultant. What mm-hmm. What is that? What does an external innovation consultant do? Well, the good thing is that I get to... I get to make that mean whatever I want it to mean. (laughs) Um, But in general, um, so the company I I do it mainly for is uh, the parent company of of the Estee Lauder uh, beauty brand. Um, So it's called the Estee Lauder Companies, which can be a little bit confusing. Um, But they also own brands like Mac and Clinique um, and Smashbox. But basically, like what what I do with them, um, there's a couple different ways that it works. So the first way is they have like a problem that they're looking to solve. It could be technical, um, could be, you know, something related to how they're reaching customers. Um, it it could be basically anything. And what we, what kind of like they'll come to me with is, Hey, we've exhausted all of our internal ways of solving this problem. And we've also talked to like our existing cosmetics vendors and they don't have a solution. Um, now cosmetics is an interesting industry where it has a lot of overlap with a whole bunch of other things. Um, so the odds are like, the problems they're trying to solve have been solved in other industries. So what I get to do is uh, figure that out, right? So I I go look at other industries. Um, Oftentimes it's actually startups who who have solved the problem. Um, But sometimes it's also other big companies that have solved the problem and just, you know, it could be um, something that they're more specialized in, right? So we we actually find quite a few solutions from like the food and beverage industry. Um, You know, the uh, obviously digital comes into play a lot. Um, but even like the paper industry, uh, there's, there's a whole bunch of things where we've kind of been surprised at who has actually solved the problem, but usually somebody outside of the cosmetics field, um, has solved the problem. And was this something that you ever thought that you were going to do for work? 
No, not at all. I didn't even know it existed. Yeah. So <laughs> um, how, how did you yeah. end up there? How'd you end up there doing that? Um, so kind of a long, long series of, uh, of left turns in, in different industries. But, um, actually one of my, uh, probably my, my closest mentor actually Chaz Giles, um, who was, who's also the founder of mom trusted. Uh, he actually ended up joining Estee Lauder after, um, you know, he was kind of winding down, uh, mom trusted as a full-time job for him. And so since, he, since you've mentioned yeah, it a couple yeah. times now, what is mom trusted? So mom trusted is basically like this, uh, social, um, kind of platform for parents to connect in with uh, child care centers that currently have open spots. So um, they can kind of like look at who else in their kind of trusted network. So almost in, like think of like kind of like a LinkedIn type of uh, format uh, where you can see like you have like a friend of a friend who sent their child to a school because trust is such a real, you know, important thing for, for child care. Um, so that was kind of what we built, like a social graph uh, way of looking at looking at early education. Um, but yeah, so he joined, um, Estee Lauder as the head of external innovation, uh, when it was basically like not a role. So he, he did some of the, I would say the dirty work of establishing what this thing even is. Um, probably for about six months, um, before, so at the end at that time I was doing a whole bunch of uh, consulting with a bunch of different startups. Um, and, and that we can get into this, uh, later, but, um, because in my startup related roles, I had done a whole bunch of negotiating with big companies uh, as Chaz was kind of looking to scale the, the group that he had. And by scale, I mean, hire his first person. Um, he, was, he was basically like, hey, like, would you ever be interested in working in, you know, with a big company? You'd still be a consultant, but kind of like an internal consultant um, with an estate email and everything, which was turned out to be pretty important. Uh, and yeah, and kind of like one thing led to another and it turned out to be kind of the right thing for what I was trying to learn at the time, which was how do big companies actually do things? Um, I think I had like in my head, having only been on the startup side before I had in my sort of like imagination, I thought things were um, kind of this like well-oiled machine inside of big companies. And that like turned out not at all to be the case. So, I, you know, I learned a ton during the, during the role. And you met Chaz through, mom trusted, which you were also working at with him, right? Yeah. So that is actually a, actually a pretty good story. Um, when, uh, when I basically, I was, so I was super burnt out of the, the startup that I had, which was college Zen. Um, and basically at the end of 20, so beginning of 2013, um, I basically turned it over to my co-founder to run. Uh, and I was kind of like looking at what's, what's next for me. Um, I was a second semester senior, uh, part-time. So I was like, you know, I had like two classes to do. So I just had like a whole bunch of time now that I wasn't doing the startup. Um, and I was kind of trying to figure out what am I going to do for work? Um, so I went to one of our mentors, uh, for, for the startup actually, uh, which was Sean Amirati from Birchmere Ventures mm -hmm. and was basically just like mentioning that, you know, Hey, I'm looking for jobs. Um, do you know anyone who's hiring? So he did intros to actually two of his companies. Um, one was mom trusted and then, uh, another one was no wait. Uh, which is actually bought like a couple weeks ago by Yelp. Um, oh, wow. I didn't and, know that. Yeah. Yeah. They were like a lot later stage than mom trusted was at the time. So, um, but anyway, like as a 22 year old guy, like being intro to a restaurant company and then to a childcare company, I was much more interested in the restaurant company, even though they were bigger and might not have been, uh, might not have been, um, you know, maybe as much learning involved. Uh, but Chaz, who was the CEO of Mom Trusted, responded to the intro email first. So I spoke to him first and was super, super impressed um, with just everything that I heard. And so I was like, you know what, like, I think I'm just going to like do, uh, you know, 10 hour a week kind of thing with with Mom Trusted. And uh, no wait, didn't get back to me for a few days. I mean, they got back to me, but, um, you know, I was kind of looking to start something immediately. So uh, I had already committed to Mom Trusted by then. And it turned out to just be like, just an incredible, incredibly good experience. So all of this kind of progression sort of started with the startup that you started in college, which mm -hmm. was College Zen, right? Yep. And that led into a couple name iterations, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was also the college people, right? Yeah, that's so that's how it started, and then okay. uh, and then it kind of transitioned over to Got College it. Zen. And and so that helped you meet Sean, who introduced you to Chaz at Mom Trusted, and then that eventually led to this work you're doing at Estee Lauder now, right? Yeah, exactly. So, so um, how did none of those things could have been predicted? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
so how how did college then college people get started then? You were still a student, right? Yeah. So that one was um so that was sort of born first out of my own kind of um, somewhat frustrating uh, college search, and then um, seeing it, you know, from a, another perspective when my brother was applying to college. Okay. Um, actually, probably the same year you were applying to college. So yeah. Um, so for me, like I decided CMU over the the second school that I was considering between it was Johns Hopkins, and um, you know I think they're they're both obviously like ranked very similarly. Um, so for me, it obviously came down to like the actual campus and like who was going to be attending the school. Um, and I didn't find out until like two days before I made my final decision. When I visited the two schools back to back days, I didn't fully even get to interact with the current student. Like there was really no way for me to go do that. And by doing that, when I actually went on campus and just, even then it was still walking up to random people <laughs> right, and talking <laughs> to them. Um, I just got so much of a better sense of like the people uh, who attended those schools and like, you know, the Johns Hopkins people were great, but there was just something I connected to uh, with the CMU people. And obviously there's so much chance involved in that, like who I talked to, like who happened to be in a good mood that day or whatever. Yeah. Um, I will say it happened to be a sunny day in Pittsburgh, which doesn't Okay, happen. that makes a big difference. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was like the sunny day. Everybody was outside. Like The one of it, 10 in the spring. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So like they, they, they sold me on uh, false advertising, but exactly. it's always this beautiful. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and everyone, I'm sure you remember this, how happy everybody got when the sun was out. Oh my gosh. It was, uh, it was a completely different school. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I saw it on one of those days. Um, and yeah, so that obviously was not necessarily the, the right idea, but, um, anyway, that's how I had made my decision. And then I saw my brother, uh, going through the application process too. And he kept asking me to introduce him to friends I had from high school at other schools, right? Like, so he was applying to Duke and he uh, asked for a friend who goes there. He was applying to the University of Michigan um, and asked me for an intro there. And then just as I did a few of those, I was like, why is there not a way for someone to just go online and just talk to a current student? Like it, that in a way that's not a creepy Facebook message or like, like, you know, there just has to be a way to go do that. Um, and so that's just honestly how it started. So we made like essentially a landing page and then uh, connected. So we were getting high school students just through my own high school, kind of as like a proof of concept. Um, we got the like the guidance counselors just sent out like a couple emails and stuff and mentioned it to people. Um, and then on the college student side, we just sort of it was like me and one other person. And we built uh, just our own through our own network, right? Like this network of current students at schools. And um, it lived on a spreadsheet, right? Like it was what's their major and what's, the, you know, like all these different things. And so a high school student would basically fill out a form, um, would talk about like, you know, what kinds of schools they're looking at, like what are the most important factors, um, you know, like is weather an important factor or whatever, right? Like what are they looking at majoring in? And then we would like match them up with a current student, right? And, um, and we basically just charged like $20 for a half hour conversation of which I think 15 went to the student and then we got five, right? And we did we didn't do very much in the first year, obviously we did 20, I think like 25 conversations. Um, but it was an interesting proof of concept. Right. And like, just to see like that people wanted that. Um, and then at the kind of, so we went from that to, uh, we just started like exploring the business model a little bit more. And, um, we then decided for, you know, a whole bunch of different reasons to turn it more into like a social platform type of thing, um, where then colleges could get the data on what types of things students were interested in. Um, that actually turned out to not be the best part of business model. <laughs> just do not pay that much for stuff. Uh, particularly when you think about, so for us, uh, the problem that we were solving, which was like connecting students to schools and then college students, the best colleges don't really have that problem, <laughs> right? Like they get a whole lot of applications. Um, it's usually the lower ranked schools or the like for-profit schools, right. That are looking for, you know, as many more applications that they can get because the top students are going to apply to, you know, the same 10 schools anyway. Um, so we were not really running into that problem. So we did like a mini pivot before alpha lab actually, um, and which was, hold to on. what is alpha, alpha lab? Sorry. Yeah, no problem. Um, we so we know these lab, things, but yeah, <laughs> that's a good point. Um, yeah. So alpha lab is a startup accelerator in, in Pittsburgh. Got it. So it's kind of like, uh, you know, if people are familiar with Y Combinator, the startup accelerator out in Silicon Valley, this is a 
another one trying to do a similar thing, but based in Pittsburgh. Yep, exactly. And and I went to school in Pittsburgh at, at Carnegie Mellon, so just more of a location thing than anything else. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so bef- even before that, we saw there were some flaws in our in our business model, um, and had to just start to figure out like who actually wants what we're like like who, from a paying side, right? Like who actually would use this. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we started actually looking at more like the low income communities because we we started like this is sort of a random insight, but um, we saw that like students were not even applying to these schools, even though they had the right grades and the right GPA uh, and, and the right like SAT scores and stuff. Yeah. It was it was more of like they just couldn't they, they didn't know anybody who went to those schools. Right. So it just never crossed their mind even. Um, and so we sort of added another factor, which was like connecting you to people with similar backgrounds to you. Um, which would just sort of, you know, the idea was if it's from your high school, nothing like that. Right. But then you probably don't need us to get to that person. Mm -hmm. Um, but if it's maybe from a neighboring high school, you would have no connection to that person. Right. Or, or somebody who, um, even from across town, but in like a neighborhood that you would have been familiar with. Um, so we, we started doing that and that turned out to be something that colleges were interested in because they were really struggling actually, you know, as much as, uh, colleges give a whole lot of lip service to, like diversity of backgrounds and incomes and things like that. But um, they essentially have like racial diversity in some ways, um, but they don't have a ton of income diversity and background diversity actually. Oh yeah. Uh, and they have, I mean, it's tough for them to get to that. Right. But, but there's also a big sort of top of funnel problem um, where they're actually not getting applications from, you know, people in certain communities who, who just have not really thought about Harvard or Princeton as being like one of the possibilities. Yeah. Um, I mean, you, I don't know if you saw this when you were growing up, but even at my, uh, high school, which was, you know, a decent high school, not, not terrible, not amazing. Um, there were a whole bunch of people who just like, no matter what their grades or, or SAT scores were, they were going to the state school, like didn't matter. Um, uh, same thing with like community college, right? It, it, it's sort of like an expectation, like self-fulfilling prophecy, um, kind of thing. And, uh, yeah. So part of it was like an awareness problem. Have you seen that there's, there's some startup that, helps more underprivileged students get into college by sending out applications to get free laptops or something. Oh, have, interesting. Oh, yeah. I haven't seen that. It's pretty cool. They, they send out these forms that you can submit to try to get a free laptop, but the submission form is the same as a like general college admissions form. Hmm. And then they take those and they send them off to a bunch of colleges that those kids never would have applied to anyway. And then these kids get these really great college opportunities they never would have thought to apply to in the first place. That's really clever. Yeah. I like that approach a lot. I can't remember the name of it, but I'll try to look it up after. Um, We can include it in the notes. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. Yeah, so Um, you you can go ahead. I was going to ask some follow-up questions on the college and stuff. Okay, yeah, well, I'll, uh, I guess I'll just finish the the narrative, but yeah, um, yeah, so then we, so we got into Alpha Lab. Uh, We actually did get a few, you know, good college contracts. So we were working with um, UPenn, we were working with CMU, um, and, and, you know, a handful of other schools in that kind of same, uh, category. The one major issue we still ran into was like, it was a cost per lead game and the amount we, we would get paid per lead was not very high. And that's because the definition of a lead in that industry is, um, very much bastardized. So in most industries, a lead would be, you know, someone fills out a form, you know, for, nat uh, nat's college right and sends you in you know it'll send you an email it'll say hey like neil is interested in nat's college um and here's his information right here's how his emails address whatever um in the college industry uh it actually works in a much weirder and in my opinion unethical way where um when you fill out you know on the sat they ask you what majors you might be interested in um they use that question, actually, the college board uses that question to then turn around and sell your information to colleges. So if you remember back when you were applying, you got all this mail, emails and and physical mail um, from schools that you never filled a lead form out for. And, you know, you're probably wondering, like, how did they get your information? That's the college board selling your information. And obviously those leads are not worth very much because you didn't even, you know, fill out anything for them. Um, so the, the kind of market price for a lead was not being tracked through to conversion, right? Like in most industries, your lead is kind of um, defined by like the value of the conversion. And then there's, you know, math that's done all the way down the funnel. 
Um, but in the college industry, it's like there's a whole lot there's there's a whole lot of more variables, and the best schools obviously don't really need to track through all the way. And then the shitty schools, which are you know more like, and we can get into this too. But um, some of the things I saw with for profit colleges, um, they're the ones that are really good with their sort of understanding the value of a lead. And they, you know, to be fair, they actually pay a whole lot of money for a lead. Um, and they truly understand, you know, what that, that lead is worth. But then you have to think about what you are spending your time doing, which is <laughs> with some of these for-profit schools, they were asking us like, how many single mothers can you get to the site? Uh... And how many veterans can you get to the site? And, you know, yeah, it was just, it was one of those where it's like, do we really want to be in that business? And yeah. uh, we kind of made the, the, uh, <laughs> joint decision of like that's not you know kind of what we want to spend our life doing those for-profit colleges are shady man yeah i mean i think there's there's got to be some like decent ones out there but a whole lot of them are basically like i mean th- the model is like the loan is guaranteed by the government mm-hmm. right so like they get paid um and if the person doesn't get a job afterwards and can't pay back their loan that's the person's problem yeah and the government's problem but that's not the for-profit school's problem and they um, they really target yeah like single mothers and minorities and veterans, like immigrants, or veterans. Yeah. Yeah. So it was just one of those, uh, it was just one of those where like, I mean, you know, I understand people got to pay the bills and like, you know, they can do it, you know, they need to do, but it just, as a like 22 year old recent grad, like it just was not what I wanted to go spend my, my time doing. So if the, you know, with the existing model, um, we ended up actually taking more of a nonprofit type of approach. Um, and so we got into, there was a program that the Bill and Melinda Gates had actually called, uh, and the name, I don't like the name, but it's called the College Knowledge Challenge. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, always, I always trip up over that name. Um, but yeah, they, so basically it was all around kind of, it was good, really good timing actually with our kind of uh, our pivot and then where we were kind of mentally, like where, you know, this was not working, our business model was not working. Um, so they announced this challenge, which was basically how do you help these sort of disadvantaged communities um, apply to, to school. So our product was kind of right in, up that alley. Um, so we applied, we got in, um, they basically like funded it for a little while. And uh, so, so it was actually quite a big grant. It was a hundred K grant, which um, my co-founder was able to use for a couple of years to try to turn, you know, figure out like what the real business model is. Yeah. But then at the end of the day, they were just the, the lead business model was not the model for this. Um, so yeah, then he shut it down after that. Got it. Was it scary leaving it when you did? Oh yeah, yeah. Because I mean, um, I mean, you you know about this, uh, but in like in college, a lot of people you know get internships and stuff over the summer. And I had done one internship um, after freshman year, so I interned with uh, Booz Allen Hamilton, which was actually a really interesting opportunity because it wasn't like a client facing um, internship. It was actually an internal project they had around uh, like new business development, which is actually kind of cool. Um, so my internship that I had done was was good, but it was when I was a freshman and then I was a senior, right? And looking for a job. And so, yeah, that was scary because I just, I had no other background besides this company that I started and, you know, kind of fell flat on its face from where I expected uh, it to get. And yeah, absolutely. It was scary. But you were you were able pretty quickly to turn around and get that mom trusted opportunity, right? Yeah, I mean it was it was like two weeks later. <laughs> um, so you, you weren't so, scared but for it was long. Still scary with the mom trusted uh, thing as well because like we started at um, you know just it was like a ten hour a week kind of thing, and for the first couple weeks it was just like let's try this out, like no no payment on either side. Um, and, uh, and then we switched to like, you know, I mean, it wasn't a whole lot of money, but like a thousand dollars a month, but again, it's like a part-time thing while you're in school, like whatever, it's beer money. Right. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and then, so after a couple months of it, um, they gave me a full-time offer, but like it was a four person team at the time. Right. So it was very small. Um, they had kind of like a head, uh, head of engineering, head of design, the two founders, and then I would be coming into lead growth, which obviously is not something I'd done. Like I'd run a startup, but it, it, you learn some of those skills, but there's a whole bunch of skills that, you know, you don't know. Um, and then, uh, you know, and then of course you're like supposed to now run growth. So you're supposed to hit certain metrics and that, like that stuff was all kind of scary as being a 22 year old. Um, and then the other thing that was scary was the, the offer. So the offer was, uh, $42,000 a year to go live in the Bay area, which, 
<laughs> you know that is uh, that yeah. is brutal. Um, but of course, I mean there was like equity and performance incentives and all that stuff. But the only guaranteed amount was uh, was that. So um, that was probably well, that was also scary because there were there were other opportunities that I was um, sort of like I, I was pretty sure I could get um, that would have been with more traditional companies, but and would have paid a lot more. Um, but it wasn't kind of what I was trying to optimize for, which was, um, definitely like learning. Um, and then, you know, I think some of it too was, uh, when I saw Chaz, like, and when I started working for him, especially, um, he's probably like the best leader, not, not probably actually definitely the best leader that I've worked for. Uh, and like definitely the best manager that I've worked for. So I think some of what I messed up on at college Zen was just the like day-to-day management and like leadership of people working with me. Right. I assume that people had kind of the same stuff going through their head that I did, um, which is like totally not true. So some of it was, I just wanted to work for like a great manager and just see how that person operates kind of up close. Um, yeah. So that was, that was a big factor. And I mean, you mentioned this with leading growth there, but it also came up a lot in the college Zen discussion because you said that you guys started it as a landing page and a spreadsheet, right? Yep. Well, how did you learn how to do that or how to test a company that way? Like what was, what was the process? Had you done that on other projects before or? <laughs> um, so I actually did, I, I call the landing page and, uh, and the spreadsheet, like the, uh, the ghetto test, but I've actually done a ghetto or test of, of an idea. Um, actually I have an actual company. So the previous summer before that, so between my senior year of high school and my freshman year of college, um, like during that entire year. So I, I grew up, uh, playing tennis and then I, I played at CMU actually. Um, but during that summer I was just going to be like teaching tennis. Right. And I was at this country club making minimum wage, right? <laughs> like not making mo- any money really after anything. And, but it was something to do. And like, you know, you get to be outside all day and, and you get some money. So that was cool. Um, but I saw like what parents were paying for the lessons. Right. And I was like, but I only get, you know, $7 an hour (laughs) and they just paid $50 for that hour. So where's the rest going? Yeah. I was like, I want that $50 an hour. Um, so I, I was like, well, there's high school courts, you know, near my house. I'm sure there's people in the neighborhood who want like lessons. So I printed up a flyer. I actually just went into word. It's like the most disgusting flyer ever clip art, man. Like, (laughs) <laughs> and put this thing together in Word, printed it out actually at school uh, because I didn't want to pay for paper and yep. printing stuff. So <laughs> I printed it out on a school printer at uh, at lunch. And then uh, I think on like, it was like a Saturday or something. Um, I just like walked around the neighborhood and put these flyers in people's um, people's mailboxes. And I had, you know, an email, like a Yahoo email on the flyer. Uh, and, uh, I think like by the end of the weekend, I had like maybe 10 people who had sent me an email. Oh, that's great. Um, yeah. And I mean, you know, I obviously didn't have like pricing or anything like that on the flyer, but, uh, you know, and then I started talking to them by email and was like, yeah, like we do this thing. Uh, it'll be, you know, I think I was charging at the time, like $25 for an hour. I was like, let's start there. <laughs> but, uh, that's a big step up from $7 an hour. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I actually noticed like, oh, well there's these, you know, seven parents who have, or seven, you know, children who, or seven parents who want to give classes, you know, for their children. And instead of doing that over seven hours, like, what if I could just combine those into like a group class? And then I'm making, you know, $300 in an hour instead of, you know, $25. So, uh, yeah, so it was just kind of like that. And like that company was never really a company, right? It was more of just a a way for me to to make some extra money that summer. But um, yeah, I think like, I'm actually trying to get back more to that as I, I think, get more experienced. Um, Cause it's something that like, at least for me is a big problem is like, I'll tend to like overcomplicate things mm-hmm. as I learn more about them. Whereas when I don't know anything about something, I can drill down to the basics pretty easily. Like I think most people probably can. So for like the tennis thing, it was like, how do I reach people? Uh, I guess I'll just put something in their mailbox, right? Like it yeah. was just super simple. Um, yeah, instead of like sometimes I think we get over bogged down in in complication. Yeah, it's pretty easy to get sucked into all the intricacy once you're more experienced with stuff. Yeah, it's like, oh, I need to like build this feature and build that. And like, yeah, a lot of times you do, but it's usually you'd almost rather build it after you absolutely need to. And it's confirmed that you need to. Yeah. And people are like mad at you for not having it than to like 
than to like build it before. Cause I mean, um, you know, I think with college Zen, we definitely made this mistake too. Like we started off really good by doing the landing page and, and spreadsheet thing. But then, uh, when we switched more to like the social platform, we went for super complicated right away and that screwed us up. Like we had, um, we had tons of bugs on our site when we got, so we actually were able to get press in the Washington post, which was pretty cool. Yeah, um, pretty cool. in, so on CMU's homepage, right? Like there were, there were like a whole bunch of cool things that we got, but then our site was not fully working at the time. Ooh. And, uh, like, you know, we were able to sort of like come up with like a workaround, but we still missed out on probably like tons of leads that would have at least submitted like their email. if we just had like a landing page there. Um, yeah, so I don't know. It's like it, it's definitely a balance between like complication and like coming up with the right solution. Um, but yeah, I'm trying to like get back actually to more of that like simple approach, at least in the the super early days. What are you trying to get back to that approach with right now? Um, so for uh, these days, actually, I'm working on a new company, uh, which is called Unlimited Brewing Company, and basically what we're doing with that is. Um, so it's kind of like a two-sided marketplace again, where you have on one side people who want to create um, their own custom beer. So that could be events, it could be you know businesses, could be people like you, Nat. Hint, hint. Yep. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, and on the other side we have breweries. So usually like small, uh, you know, smaller breweries, but it's not limited to that. Um, and we use their sort of uh, their equipment downtime. Um, to brew custom batches. So if a brewery is only operating, you know, two or three days a week, um, their equipment's just kind of sitting there for four days uh, and they're still paying for it. So they're very eager to kind of work with us and, and you know, help our customers create something custom. Um, you know, I think like as this scales, there's a whole lot of um, optimization work that needs to happen. So, you know, we're trying to, like right now it's honestly, it lives in a spreadsheet, right? We have a landing page, but it's again, living in a spreadsheet and then I'm calling the breweries that I'm working with and we're working out the logistics like over the phone. Um, but it's honestly a really good way to learn about the business because you hear about like all the concerns that there are. There's, I mean, this industry is really complicated from a licensing perspective, uh, shipping perspective, like the trucking company needs to have a special license to move the beer. Uh, there's, I mean, there's just like all these different things that you would never know if you just sort of like, I'm just going to Google about this industry and like look at the first two links. Like you would never know. Um, and then also, like, because it's a marketplace, right, the price points are um, kind of, like, dynamically shifting. So, um, you know, brewery, depending on where it's located, if it's, like, let's say in, like, a resort town, in the winter, they have, like, almost 100% open capacity. And, like, they'll you can pay them, like, almost nothing, and they'll do a job for you because it's incremental revenue for them. But in the summer, they might be, like, you know, busy six days a week. So to get scheduled on that one day is not actually that easy because they want to give their, um, you know, their staff, like, a day off and... Uh, you know, like there, there, there's all these different factors. So, um, yeah, I think like starting that one with the landing page and then just the, the spreadsheet approach was definitely the right way to go. Um, because there's like so many things that I know now just by talking to all these people that I would have honestly never been able to find out on my own because, you know, I don't come from the industry. Like I haven't spent 25 years working at a brewery or as like, you know, a alcohol lawyer or something like that. Yeah. And it seems like, you were able to do that while still working with Estee Lauder, right? Yeah, but I think that's mostly because, so I'm a consultant with Estee Lauder, uh, meaning I don't have to be in the office all the time, um, which helps a lot. So if <laughs> if you ever have to work with a big company and not be in the office, it's it's tolerable. Yeah. Um, but yeah, being in, like, I don't do well when um, my time is controlled. Yeah, you <laughs> and I both. Like, yeah, I know. I think you more than me. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably true. Uh, I can I can handle like the phone calls a little bit, like <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. But yeah, I think, <laughs> um, yeah. But you know, because I get kind of that space, like I do, you know, because they are a big company, there is like a non compete um, and things like that with within the beauty industry. So but you can't start um, you know, a limited makeup company. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but they uh, obviously don't sell beer, so yeah. That was not a not an issue there. Yet, yet. Yeah, maybe they'll, they'll, use they'll pick you up. Exactly. Make some beer. <laughs> uh, well, was there anything that you learned from being in there and working with them while still being an outsider that's been really helpful to you? Uh, for Este? Yeah. Just yeah, like a, I mean... Oh, go ahead. Well, no, I was just going to say in terms of both you know, the relationships between big companies and startups, but then also uh, managing now your own startup. 
Um, I think like this time around, like so this time around, meaning with Unlimited Brewing Company versus in like the mom trusted in college Zen days, um, I'm a lot less intimidated by big companies, to be honest. Uh, okay. um, I think, yeah, I think like in the in the past, I assumed there was um, a lot more order inside of big companies, uh, a lot more of like a system. Um, I just assumed like, okay, well, they have 20,000 people working for them. Like they must be working on something that's like better than what these three people in this dorm room are working on. Yeah. Um, but that turns out to like be the opposite of what's actually true. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's actually like, I mean, I think a lot of like big companies, like you, like we'll start with the basics, right? So, um, like big companies became big because they spotted, you know, there's a certain need that the founder of that company spotted, um, figured out how to solve really, really well. And then they built like an infrastructure around that. Um, so like Estee Lauder herself, like used to make creams and makeup in her kitchen and then like walk around her neighborhood selling them. Like that's the origin of the company. Um, and then of course that like, as that scales and like she got into department stores and all these different things, like, you build this infrastructure around it and at some point in time and for i think for for estee lauder like estee lauder the founder like she was very much connected to the customers but also the company was a lot smaller at that time and since um so then you know when she passed away and then um her son became the ceo to his credit he grew the company like i think almost 50x from when he took over to when he shut it, uh kind of resigned as well and um so he grew the company a lot but in that process, they acquired a whole lot of brands. So obviously, it's you know become this conglomerate now, um, and the founder isn't like on the street selling makeup anymore. Uh, so you just sort of lose a little bit of that connection with um, you know with the end consumer, uh, and that's a huge advantage that startups have. And like I never realized that at the time that like people that work for a big company, unless you're like you know the cashier or like you work on a, a showroom floor or something usually they don't interact with the customer. So actually the startup person has a better sense for what people want than, um, than the big company person. And uh, I, I don't know about, you know, when you were doing a startup and stuff, but for us, like we always tried to act bigger than we were. Um, but I think that was kind of like actually the wrong approach. Like people like that you're listening to them and that they, you know, they're talking to the founder. Like people really like that. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's like the biggest thing, right? I'm like just not intimidated by how, big companies operate because I know I can go faster and I know that I understand the customer probably a little bit better than, you know, the average person in a big company. It's probably not true across the board, but, um, yeah. So, I mean, that's one, uh, let's see. Well, it's interesting how frequently that kind of illusion plays out where I think we always think that people older or more senior or larger companies or whatever have it all together. And we're yep. the ones who are kind of, a mess and disorder and then you move up in the ranks or whatever and you get some of these experiences and you kind of realize that everyone to some extent is making it up as they go and figuring it yeah. out too. <laughs> yeah. And I also like, I think that's totally right. Um, and then I, I also think that with um, just kind of like the, I, I don't want to call it like the shark tank era because it's not what I'm trying to say, but yeah. like, we live in an era where like technology and startups um, and entrepreneurship are viewed as, as cool. Um, and large companies for, for better or for worse are, are not viewed as cool. So in a lot of ways, like again, startups have a really big advantage where um, a big company by working with, you know, with you or, you know, with your startup, um, they actually have a lot to gain. And, you know, I mean, we did a couple of deals like that at mom trusted. So like we were working with, um, uh, like PNG was one of our, one of our customers through, like, we basically had like a social, um, a social content deal with them where we would, we had a decently popular blog, um, around like preschool activities and we would basically create this content and then PNG would essentially sponsor it. Right. And like, you think about it from the perspective of like, they are the biggest advertiser, uh, I think in the world actually. Um, I think they spend more money than anybody else. And, you know, for what they were spending with mom trusted, it's like a drop in the bucket to them. But now they get to say like, Oh, we're working with this cool San Francisco startup. Um, and we get all this cool content. I mean, there's just like all these advantages that I think when, at least for me, when I was a, a, a founder the first time, um, 
you, you think about it as like, well, what can I bring to the table to a PNG, right? And you're like, oh, I can't bring anything. I have like a hundred users on my site, but like, but like you actually have a lot that they really want. Like they want that cool factor. Um, and they, it's really, really hard for them to get it. Well, there's also just some value internally to them to like for managers and stuff to say that they're working with an innovative startup, right? Was it you who was telling me this about IDEO and management consultants and stuff that sometimes they're not really hired to solve something, but to make someone look good? Yeah, or be a scapegoat. That's or the be other. a scapegoat. <laughs> <laughs> that's the other thing. Because if, um, you know, and that's actually another thing that I've seen going back to your original question, um, being kind of this like outsider, outsider, insider within Este. Yeah. Um, like, because I'm not part of like the hierarchy or like the chain of command, uh, I get to operate like outside of a lot of things where, you know, it might be, you know, taboo to, you know, for someone at like a manager level to email like an SVP or something, right? Like, it's not that it's not allowed. But people will be like, well, why is he doing that? Right. Um, but because I'm like a consultant, nobody like they like they don't know where I fit right on the, <laughs> on the scale. Um, so I've gotten to kind of cross some of those borders. And the thing I actually found really interesting is I find that people bring uh, Chaz and I into projects sometimes in order to like cross the hierarchy. Right. Like, oh, yeah. Or, or like or even cross departments, actually, more than anything, uh, actually. Uh, so even more than like the hierarchy part, it'll be like, well, you know. R and D and like digital might not necessarily communicate on a regular basis, but Chaz and I, op, you know, work with both of them. Um, so someone will be like, well, like, you know, this, like this new package could really use like this type of sensor, but like nobody in R and D knows how to do that. And, but they think it's a good idea and it probably is a good idea. So then we are the ones who bring in like the digital team or something, right? Like that, that's a very common occurrence where it's, even though like we're technically supposed to be external innovation, we get pulled in, um, to cross department boundaries because there's actually not that many ways for people to, to do that. Um, and I've heard similar things from people at, at other big companies, even ones you wouldn't expect like Google. Um, I've heard Google is like super siloed in, in the same way that I just described, right? Where um, it's not easy to kind of cross departments. Yeah. Well, it's cool that you kind of get the insight to be able to do that. Uh, so long as you don't also end up one of the scapegoats, right? Yeah, well, that's happened too, but oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. That's part of being a consultant though. Cause yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Like if you bring in, uh, going back to your management consultant thing, um, if, if you bring in a consultant and you know, something goes wrong, it's like, Oh, it was the consultant's fault. Mm. Right. But, um, if you, uh, or if the consultant makes a recommendation and it turns out to be false, right. Um, you can always blame the consultant, but the kind of the uh, surprising thing a lot of times is the, the management consultants are, uh, and we've worked alongside a bunch of them at, at ELC also. Um, a lot of times they come in with what they're supposed to come out with as the conclusion. Um, so, you know, it might be like a fact finding type of project, but they've already sort of, I don't know if it's told explicitly because I'm obviously not in the room when they're, they're having their meetings, but there's definitely like loaded questions. Oh, so <laughs> somebody could. hired them to tell somebody else something. Basically, yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 exactly. Or like the path might already be like someone might already know what they want to do, but if they suggest it, then people are going to be like, well, like, why? Like, why should we do it that way instead of this way? And then, but if the consultants are saying it right, I mean, like McKinsey and BCG and, you know, right. uh, Accenture and Deloitte and all these companies, like they can't, they can't be wrong, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's so it's so interesting how that stuff works. Know. Yeah, you you and I know that a lot of those guys are, you know, people our age also making it up as they go along. <laughs> <laughs> we do. I, I have I have a good friend who works at PwC, and every time he gets drunk, he just talks about how he has no idea what he's doing. It's yep, really amusing. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> coming back to something that you mentioned on, mentioned earlier, uh, this differentiation between optimizing for learning and optimizing for money. Can you yeah. explain that a little bit? Because I think that's a really important, useful concept for people to understand. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, so I think that like, and this obviously applies for people in kind of our situation where, you know, you live in like the United States or, you know, first world country, um, you have somewhat, uh, you know, some type of kind of support system. Um, you don't have like children or dependents that you, you know, absolutely kind of are depending on you for income. Um, but provided like all of those things, like if you have the opportunity to take a role where um, 
you know, or do a project even if even if it's independently. Uh, and you know, it doesn't bring in money, or you're not sure how much money it's going to bring in. Uh, but you have a great opportunity to learn something. Absolutely, take it. Um, I can't like I don't have any. Yeah, I can't think of any instances where I went with that type of decision uh, process and regretted it. Like it just. It, if you learn something, like you will be able to use that at some point in time. Uh, money, like I've noticed, obviously you have to be able to pay your bills, right? But like, uh, and I'm, I'm blanking on what this concept is called, but you're spending, unless you're super disciplined about it, um, your spending tends to increase with higher income. Um, or if it doesn't, your money just goes and sits in a bank account, which is a type of asset, right? Like, your bank account, yeah, it's an asset you can use if things go wrong or you, you know, want to make a giant purchase at some point or buy a house or whatever, um, you know, make investments. Like there's value to having a bank account, but there's other types of assets as well. And I think um, two that don't get enough attention are so skills, you know, I think is, is one of them that um, we've kind of alluded to here. But taking a, a role that's like lower paying, but is going to teach you a whole lot of skills. So like going back to the mom trusted example, where I'm stepping into a role where I don't know how to do probably 75% of the stuff that I'm going to have to know. Um, but I'm going to be working for somebody who I know is, is going to be able to help me get there and is going to be supportive. Um, and it's just kind of like the rest of the team is top notch. Like that's the kind of role I want to step into, right? Where, um, you know, you're going to be walking out of there, even if you walk out 12 months later, you're going to be walking out of there with a whole bunch of skills that other companies definitely want. Um, once you have those. So it's kind of like people are paying you to learn, which <laughs> I mean, Nat, I think uh, you've probably said something similar, but um, college, like you're paying other people to teach you, but in the real world, like you can get paid to learn a skill. Oh yeah. Uh, and it's just, I mean, it's like the bi biggest hack like ever. Like, I think that was mind blowing to me where I think that's one of the biggest reasons I took the $42,000 a year salary for mm -hmm. moving to the Bay area. Cause it was like, Going from like, okay, I'm paying CMU to teach me things that I'm probably not going to go use ever. Much more than $42,000 a year. <laughs> exactly. And now I'm going to get paid money <laughs> yeah. to like go learn these skills. So it's like, it's just like looking at it through a different lens. Whereas I think, um, you know, I mean, I would definitely say a lot of my peers at CMU like might have viewed their jobs as like, okay, I'm debating between the $65,000 a year offer and the $75,000 a year offer. Um, and like, you know, one might be in a cheaper location versus like the 75,000 one might be in like New York or something. And that's kind of like all the math and, and the, the, the decision making process that they're doing. Uh, I'm sure it's not like quite that simple, but like people are viewing it through like basically the money lens or the prestige lens. That's the other one I've seen um, where they'll look at like, you know, Goldman Sachs maybe versus like uh, some smaller bank and um, make the decision that way. But yeah, I think like, so the skills is a really big one. And then the other one that I use this uh, a lot to justify my estate decision as well. Um, but the network, like, I think people don't necessarily think about their personal networks as, um, as an asset, but it totally is like, I've never, yeah, I don't actually, yeah, I don't think I've ever gotten a job that I applied for. Like every single job I've ever had was through someone I knew or someone I knew who introduced me to someone I knew who introduced me to somebody else, you know, I mean, you know how it works. Yeah. Um, and it's just like that is, so if you have the opportunity to get a role where, um, you can meet a lot of people and develop like good relationships with good people, um, though that's super valuable. And I think that also applies to location. If you think about like where you're going to live and stuff like that. Yeah. I, I've heard that argument before that even though SF and New York are, probably the most expensive they also give you the best opportunities for running into potentially very interesting people at cocktail parties and things like that and that alone makes up for the price yeah I, and i think there's there's definitely truth to that um and i think also like i mean i think you and i probably talked digitally for the first like yeah <laughs> probably like year that i knew you um and, and i mean to be fair also we went to school in pittsburgh and i felt like i had a network well beyond pittsburgh even by the time i graduated um, so it's like totally doable to, to build a ne network without, um, uh, being in one of those cities. It just like, just takes a little bit of effort and it's also like not being shy about asking for, um, for intros or for like, you know, wanting to talk to people. Right. And I think if, if most people, I don't want to say this for everybody, um, 
But most people, if you're like, you have a genuine question, you're like clearly not a scumbag. Um, you're like, you know, an actual person and not trying to like sign them up for like Amway or something. <laughs> um, people will want to talk to you. Like people are nice. Like most people are pretty nice and will answer yeah. your question even by like email and stuff. Um, there, there's uh, someone I emailed actually while I was still working on College Zen and, and that you know this person because <laughs> uh, you used to work for them. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think you probably know. Uh, is it is it Noah? is it Noah Justin? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. No, it's Noah. Um, yeah, I emailed him like a question about like something social media related while I was working at College Zen, and it was like totally out of nowhere. But I saw like a video that he had uh, done about like a similar topic. I think we were looking at like how to get email subscribers or something like that. And I actually had a few questions, and I was like, I'm not going to leave this in the comments because nobody is going to look at that. Um, so I found his email, cold emailed him, and he responded. Like, yeah, he's a nice guy. He's really good about that stuff. Yeah, like people respond. Uh, people like people do respond. So, uh, and you know, like that said, there's probably like, uh, like I can someday if I ever have like a whole lot of time, that remind me. But I want to go through my like Google sent folders and see how many cold emails I've never got a response to. Uh, yeah, because there's probably a whole lot too. <laughs> um, but the thing is, you can you'll get enough responses to really build, uh, really build a network and. The thing about the networks too is like, what's that like uh, saying about like the best time to plant a tree was like 10 years, 10 ago? years ago? Yeah. Yeah. And then like the next best time is today. It's like networks are very much like that. Although I've also, I've always had a problem with that saying because it seems like nine years ago would also <laughs> be. <laughs> that is a good point. Yeah. <laughs> but I think you get what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. And like the other thing too about networks, which it, I, I, hate these uh i'm not a fan of networking events like, yeah that, well that was gonna be my question it sounds like you were meeting these people mostly by making friends and asking questions right basically yeah it was it was like basically that like asking questions was was big and then um i think like just like the other part of it is uh kind of doing your part to support the network too um so like you know, everybody is always looking to meet uh, other people who they might get along with or people who can help out their business or whatever, you know, it might be. Um, and even when you have a small network, it's like kind of amazing, like how many cool relationships or deals or different things you can put together just by introducing like friends who might not know each other or, uh, you know, like that kind of thing. Right. And, and like, I don't know if that's anything like unique that I did, but that's one thing that, like I've been doing as long as I can remember. And that was more just like, Hey, I think these two people would like to know each other. Right. Or they get along. And I mean, I know you do that all the time. Um, with like, you know, the Slack group and, and all that stuff. Yeah. Well, we were talking about it just before we got on the call too. Yeah, exactly. Right. That's exactly right. Um, and yeah, it's just like doing that stuff too is like people will start to be like, okay, well, yeah, I know this guy is like, he's not just like looking to connect with me on LinkedIn, right? Like, right. <laughs> or get me to follow him on Twitter. Like to it's not it really about those numbers. Um, yeah, it's not, I mean, those numbers help, I'm sure. Right. But like what I'm talking about when I say network is not like, Oh, I have 2000 connections on LinkedIn or, you know, 4,000 or, you know, whatever number 40,000 followers or whatever. But like, if you couldn't go to those people and like sleep on their couch, like, do you really know them? Or like, you know, like that kind of thing. Like it's more like I value those types of relationships better and, or more. And I think, I mean, I could probably do a better job with like the personal branding stuff as we were talking beforehand um, and thinking about followers that way a little bit better. But like when I think about like my network, it's more like, you know, it's people like you that I'm, you know, I can text you with a question anytime or, um, you know, like Justin, who, who we both know. And, um, you know, it's like more like who am I? comfortable with on a level that's kind of like professional but also i'm actual friends with um it just makes life better too yeah and i don't know i mean there's always going to be that moment and the time i've heard this analogy most is kind of in the dating pickup scene where if you approach someone and you're putting on a false persona to try to hook up with them sleep with them whatever you're eventually going to have to be your real self right that's At so some true point and if you approach networking with this fake, like, oh, hello, I'm Neil, I'm wearing a suit, and here's my business card, yeah. like, <laughs> I would love to, you know, pick your yeah. brain over coffee, like, the facade has to come down eventually. Exactly, yeah, and I think you, you have to, like, put yourself in the other person's shoes, too, because, like, um, <laughs> I know, I'm sure you get, like, cold emails and stuff, too, like, I mean, people are, are busy, too, so, like, being very respectful of their time 
uh, even when you just cold email them or even when you're talking to them, like the other thing that I, I've done, uh, you know, I think a lot of people do this too, is like if you're at an event where there's a speaker or whatever, and the speaker is genuinely interesting to you, um, go try to like talk to them after, but don't like talk their ear off. Yeah. Like talk to them, like talk to them for like a minute. Cause they're probably in a rush to get somewhere where there's like 20 other people behind you in line. Like be really quick. Like figure, like if you, there's something you want to follow up on, like make sure you talk about that. Um, but don't be like that annoying person. Like you don't want to be remembered as that annoying person. Cause you will never get a response. So like it's not going to happen. <laughs> um, yeah. The one way I heard that you can do that, that kind of works better is write down a question or two on an index card and give yep. it to them with your contact info. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Have you ever done that? I've never done that, but I can see that working for yeah. sure. I, I, um, I don't go to conferences yeah. enough. I want to try that one out. Yeah. I think that like, that's certainly uh, worth trying. Like, I think, yeah. And it also applies to, like cold emails too. Like, and you can always err to the side of like caution and respecting their time uh, and send like a brief email. Cause Hey, that's better than, you know, I mean, even if I'm friends with you, like, you know, no one wants to read like a book unless it's written by net, <laughs> <laughs> but nobody wants to like open up their email and be like, ah, shit, this guy's asking like 20 questions and I don't even know who he is. Um, but you know, if your email is like short to the point, even if you've never like emailed them or they get a whole bunch of emails, but it's like easy for them to respond. Um, just like make it as easy as possible, right? Like don't put roadblocks in your own way. I, I actually wrote an article about this and published it recently because I was getting more and more inbound and a lot of it was breaking those rules. So we'll have to link to nice. it afterwards. Guys, that's in the, sh that's in the uh, show notes. It's in the show notes. Exactly. <laughs> uh, speaking of articles, so you also have a site, neilsony.com, which we will also link to in the show notes. Nice. And you have an article there I really like with this idea of commodity versus luxury. And mm -hmm. yep. I think that applies to a lot of the work learning type stuff that we've been talking about so far. So can you explain that kind of dichotomy and why it's important? Yeah. So I think, um, so yeah, so the article is on my blog, I guess, uh, Nat, you're gonna, <laughs> you're, you'll link to the actual post. Um, but the kind of the basic concept is, um, for certain things, right? Like, I don't know, like what's a good example, like a toothbrush. Like, I don't care about what brand of toothbrush I have. Right. I view that. And, and I think it's personal for each person, right? Like, um, so this is kind of done on an individual level, but this whole luxury versus commodity dichotomy is for some items, I may not personally care about what brand I'm using and I might not know the different factors of what, what goes into it. So like a toothbrush is a good example for me, um, you know, paper towels, like whatever, like I'm not brand uh, dependent in those industries or for those particular types of products. But then there are some things where I'm like very much um, both brand and like research heavy. Um, so like beer is a big one for me. Coffee is, um, you know, I'm, uh, I like coffee a lot. Um, so like these are kind of, these are things where like I'm going to do research about what I'm drinking. I'm going to like look at where it's made. I'm going to like look at all these different things. And, you know, I'm not really shopping based on price in that scenario. Right. So I'm not looking at like, well, this beer is $7 and this one's eight. Like to me, that's the same. Like if it's one is seven and one is 70, okay, maybe then I'll start looking at, you know, like price obviously makes a difference, but, um, it's basically like, so this idea is like, you have to pick one of the two um, and so, you know, there's obviously a business to be had for doing something cheaper than anyone else can do it. Right. And I think, you know, to be honest, in some ways, like Amazon used to be that, like it used to be just the, the cheapest way to an easiest way. Right. I think those were the two, two factors to get like any product, um, and not pay. Like, I mean, I, I used to use this all the time for prime where, and I still do where, um, you know, you could in the past go to like best buys website or best buy store go to like a bookstore and then go to like, you know, the grocery store separately. Um, or you can just get it all on Amazon and then it'll just come up to your house. Right. So that's like, and it's done really cheap, right? If it was like, okay, yeah, we can do all that, but you're also going to have to pay $50 worth of shipping. Like I am not going to do that. Right. So, um, so, you know, you can, you can compete on price and I think that's a commodity business and there are a lot of commodity businesses and that's totally fine. Like, you know, gas is another one. There's a whole bunch. Um, luxury businesses and i think there's certain things that skew luxury so like you know craft beer is one i think um you know beauty is one but even if you think about things like media um uh, where like your attention span is limited right so let's even like just think about podcasts for a minute right like 
there are so many podcasts out there. I mean, Nat, you probably know the numbers better than I do, but there's just so many podcasts. There's even so many that I subscribe to that I don't really listen to, right? Or I listen to like very rarely, or if there's a guest that I'm like, oh, I really want to, you know, listen to that one. Um, but there are some podcasts which like I will listen to every single episode. There's actually podcasts I've gone through the entire or like working my way through the entire archive because they're just so damn good. And that's to me, right? So to me, those are like luxuries. If that, if those podcasts started charging like $5 a month, I would, there would be no hesitation in paying that. Um, so to me, like those are like, I'm viewing those as essentially luxuries, but I can obviously afford, you know, $5 a month. If they charge $5,000 a month, you know, it might be a little different story, but, um, yeah, so it's like this continuum almost, right? If we want to think about it that way, where, um, you become like less price sensitive, uh, the further along you get to the luxury spectrum. Um, and I think both as individuals, so even as somebody looking for a job, right, you want to put yourself in the, as much of a luxury standpoint and as far away from commodity because commodities, um, are the most easily replaceable, right? So if one accountant is the same as the next accountant is the same as the next accountant, then it's going to be a tough game to like not get downsized when things go wrong with the, the company or when the software can replace you, you know, it's like very, very tough to, if you're just a commodity accountant. Um, and I actually think the same thing is true for software engineers too. Like if you are, if, if you're a software engineer who is the same as the next software engineer is the same as the next software engineer, like, yeah, right now that market is really good, but that's like a very fragile, um, and there we go. There's our telebra, yep. <laughs> but there is a very fragile way to, uh, way to live. Whereas, you know, if you're a software engineer who also has a podcast, who also can do growth stuff, who also makes wine on the side, like you're probably the only person in the world who has that. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, like I, I think it also, you know, it applies to individuals as, as well as products and companies. Well, I think um, that software yeah. engineer example is so interesting because both of us coming from Carnegie Mellon, uh, you kind of saw that problem where a lot of people would get this amazing computer science education and then a couple of years into whatever company they ended up at, they would actually have a really hard time moving up because they were so uh, focused and skilled in this one area that it was really hard to like differentiate and stand out from the peers. Yep. Uh, yeah. I think, I think that's a, a really good point. Yeah. And um, you know, I mean, we can even use like uh, going back to Chaz real quick as an example. I mean, his sort of background is like very, you know, very different actually than, you know, you would think a, a typical big, per, big company person would be. Um, so he like, he has, he did an MBA right out of, right after undergrad um, in finance. So he had like kind of this math background um, and then went to P and G actually right away. And then initially was just in finance, um, but he wanted to get closer to like the product side and he was sort of like intrigued by this like innovation stuff. So he applied for this role, didn't get it. Then, you know, actually ended up getting a different role, but in the same sort of group, something that P&G had called FutureWorks. So um, it, it doesn't exist anymore, but at the time it was kind of their like internal incubator, like idea incubator. Okay. Um, and so he ended up managing that. And that was kind of like his introduction to this whole side of like startups and technology and stuff. He had like no background in that before. Um, so that was kind of the introduction. And then he went to uh, City uh, to work in their VC group actually. Uh, and ended up becoming a partner pretty quickly because of some interesting sets of circumstances, but um, that we, you know I don't know if he wants to share. So, uh, but he ended up becoming a partner actually really quickly there uh, at City Ventures. So that were like that was pretty cool. And then he decided to uh, to start his company. So, kind of had this VC experience, big company experience, founder experience. The startup did you know like Mom Trusted still around? Like didn't exit, but still has, you know, built a solid business, mostly self-funded. Um, they did one round, uh, and, uh, you know, the, so, the, so he still owns the vast, vast majority of the company. Um, and then with, you know, the Estee role, it's like, are there that many other people who've done big company, like at a company the size of P&G, they've done a startup that was, you know, moderate, did moderately well, and also have, you know, done VC kind of at the highest level there's like not that many people who've had all three experiences. Um, so that makes him like really valuable for a company like Estee Lauder, uh, as they're looking at, you know, who, who takes that role. Like there's not a whole lot of competition, right? Right. When you look at it that way. 
because the role does require all three of those things, right? I mean, it requires understanding how to op- navigate and operate within a big company, requires like knowing how to do a deal, um, and then it also requires like understanding the startups that you're going to be working with. And there's not a whole lot of people with that background. Yeah. So the other thing that I really like about your site is that for your email list anyway, you send out your favorite books that you've read each month and little synopses and bits about them with those recommendations. And you're probably one of the most well-read people that I know. Has that always been a habit of yours? <laughs> uh, yeah, I was actually just talking about this with someone yesterday. So the um, my reading uh, history has been like very checkered um, over the my entire life. So I, I, when I was little, I loved reading. Um, and then I think at some point in like middle school, I started thinking that like reading wasn't cool. Um, <laughs> so I like basically didn't read, even if it was like an assigned book, I would skim my way through it. Um, and just like avoid reading at all costs. And I think I like, it's probably one of the regrets I have. Um, like I still think, you know, it made me, you know, like I value reading more so probably because of that gap. Um, but I still think like there were a lot of really good books that were assigned in school that like I've read since that I'm like, man, I wish I read this when I was in high school. Cause it probably would have led to some different decisions or something. Um, but then I, I like picked it back up actually in, probably like junior year of college um freshman year i I read like a little bit because you know like cmu that's one of the things i I really value about cmu was made me kind of comfortable being a nerd um because like i that's like definitely my genuine self is fairly nerdy um but i like wasn't scared to be that way uh at cmu so there were always people who were going to be more nerdy than you um so cmu just made me more very you know comfortable with with that so i never like starting at cmu i didn't really view reading is like not cool anymore. I just didn't have as much time for it um, as I might have wanted. So maybe like freshman and sophomore year, I didn't read a whole lot. Junior year, I actually had a lot of trouble sleeping um, with, uh, and I think a lot of it was like with the company and then like, uh, you know, I was doing, so my major was chemical engineering, which is not pretty intense. Yeah. So it was just like from a work and like labs type of standpoint, just a lot of, uh, just a lot of like late nights and then lots of coffee and like just not a good way. And then obviously like I was, you know, drinking a bunch on the weekend and just not a good, healthy way to live. Um, yeah. so I think at one point I was like just exploring different ways to like help me fall asleep quicker because even if I was tired, I just like wasn't falling asleep. Um, and I forget where I came across it, but it was just a random, uh, thing where I was just like Googling it. And I saw a recommendation of like, try to read, you know, before you go to bed. And I was like, Oh, that's kind of like killing two birds with one stone. Cause I want to find more time to read. Uh, and this, if it helps me sleep, that's awesome. Um, so I actually like first started trying to read, uh, Robert Greene's 33 strategies of war because <laughs> actually 48 laws of power was one of my favorite books. Um, and, and that I'd read over one of the summers, uh, in college, but then 33 strategies of war, I tried to read it. I wasn't thinking about fiction versus nonfiction. Or yeah. Anything. That's intense like, pre-bed reading. <laughs> it is. No, it totally is. But like, I didn't realize that. So I would like still stay up, but I was like, at least having fun staying up. I was like enjoying it uh, instead of like laying there and having like my thoughts racing. Right. (laughs) Um, So this was like a little bit better. And I basically just read, would read until I like couldn't keep my eyes open anymore. Um, And so it did kind of like, it made my uh, nights a little bit less frustrating. And then I actually uh, read something else that said, um, try fiction before bed. And so uh, then I started kind of trying to do that. And, uh, and I just like started reading a lot more cause I just noticed like whether it was nonfiction or fiction and stuff, I was like, there's a whole lot of knowledge in these books that I'm like not getting in school. Um, and no one's telling them to me. Right. So it was just like, it kind of felt like this almost secret place where I was getting like a whole bunch of interesting stuff, um, that I just didn't have access to elsewhere. Uh, so yeah, one thing kind of led to another, I really picked up reading to like another level when I was, when I moved to California, um, So when I was saying like, you know, it wasn't making a whole lot of money, like one thing I started doing very early on um, when I moved there was like, I basically said, I'm going to spend like when I was budgeting for living out there, I was said, I'm going to spend $50 a month on books, regardless of, you know, whatever I'm making or, you know, it was just like a commitment I was making to myself um, to force myself to, to get books. And then I noticed like if it was sitting there, um, you almost like didn't have a reason not to pick it up at some point in the day. Um, So I did that. And then. It just like, I, 
I don't know if you feel this way. For me, it's like every book I read, I feel like I add like two books to my to read list. Yeah. So it's just like, I feel like I'm in this, like not race because I'm definitely not like speed reading. I, I'm like not a fan of that at all. Um, but I just feel like there's so much knowledge out there that like, I'm never going to get <laughs> a race against death for how many Basically. books we can try to absorb. Yeah. Like, have you ever heard that like AI concept of where they're like, Oh, like computers will be able to absorb like all the knowledge and all the books in like an instant. Right. And yeah. I'm like, I'm so jealous. I wish that could happen. Well, yeah, as, <laughs> long, as long as you can pick the books. <laughs> exactly, right. I'm yeah. not sure I want to absorb the secret and things like that. No, that's a good point. That's a really <laughs> good point. Um, yeah, and I mean, honestly, like, there's a whole lot of trial and error, too, with reading. Uh, there's like, you know, you're going to come across books that just suck. And I was really bad at dropping books. Like, I don't know what it is. Uh, I, I heard a lot of people have that problem. Um, you feel yeah, guilty start, doing it. Yeah, me too. Or I'm like, I'm hoping that it's going to turn around. Right. Um, but sometimes it just, it just does not. Um, yeah. Naval, uh, Ravikant actually, I saw, or I didn't see, I heard on a podcast, I think he was on the Shane Parrish one knowledge project. Maybe it was either that or one of the Tim Ferriss ones where he was talking about, he gave himself permission, uh, somewhat recently to like, just pick up or drop a book at any t point in time. Um, like full permission. So he was like, I'll read like four pages and then be like, oh, this isn't interesting and drop it. Or I'll like look at the table of contents, skip to like chapter seven and start from there and just never go back to the earlier chapter. Like, so he kind of has gone all the way to that one extreme. Um, and then I know other people who are just like, you know, they're like power through because you never know, it, you know, at some point it might turn around as being one of the be best books. Um, actually, a deal uh, when he recommended The Count of Monte Cristo, which I'm in the middle of right now, um, he said it starts off really good. Then it, like the middle part he said is really tough to push through, but if you push through, it's like one of the most fantastic finishes um, in a book that scene. So like, I'm, I think I'm past that middle point now. And it honestly has taken me a couple months to get through the book. Um, but like that middle part took forever for me to get through, but I like didn't put it down because of what he said. So um, yeah, because now it's like really picking up again. And it's pretty interesting. I'm kind of having that experience with Infinite Jest, which I've been slowly very slowly working. Through. I haven't read that, but I've I've heard I've heard good things, but it's, I've heard it's a it's a commitment. Yeah, I have no idea what's going on eighty percent of the time, <laughs> and then twenty percent of the time you stumble into just some of the most brilliant, poignant writing on just the human experience, and it's just beautiful. And you're like, okay, I, I get why I pushed through this now. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Actually, yeah. and uh, to like say a couple other things about reading, like um, going back to like the knowledge thing, it's it's amazing like how much is like just sitting there in books. And I think you've, you've actually written about this, but, and uh, so has our, our good buddy Taleb um, about like, I think it's the Lindy effect, right? Yeah. The, yeah, The Lindy rule. Yeah. The things that are, um, you know, older uh, tend to have a little more lasting power and, mm -hmm. you know, by virtue of their age. And I've noticed too, like there's so many modern problems that whether it's personal business, whatever um, that the solutions are just like sitting there. Yeah. And it's like, if you just read and like explore and like try to find it, like there, there are very few problems that like humans have not experienced. I mean, there, to be fair, there are definitely some where like it's the first time we're going through it as a species, but um, there's a whole lot that are like, there's things, you know, that, that people have already talked about or explored or tried um, that, you know, you could learn from, or it could even just be like an interesting thing that like you know, for a company, even like um, I'm trying to think of an example off the top of my head, but, I mean, I know even for, for beer, right? Like, so my concept of unlimited brewing company, which is essentially like a scaled distributed brewery, um, is not fully like a new thing. Like there are, like people have done contract brewing for a long time. Um, uh, actually Sam Adams was started as a contract brew. Like they brewed it in Pittsburgh, um, actually at a, a large, almost defunct brewery at the time and then shipped it to Boston. Right. And that's, it was, it's a Boston beer company, but it was made in Pittsburgh, um, uh, and that's like, that happened, you know, probably 30 years ago now at this point, if not more than that. Um, so yeah, like, I mean, it's not truly a new concept. What's new about it is how we're trying to do it at scale, right? Which is maybe that's a new kind of somewhat difficult thing, but it's been done in other industries too. Um, so, but it's like, again, this concept is not necessarily new. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I like the people have shared. Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, Sorry. I was, I was going to say, I like the idea of reading books that are as old as the problem. Mm. because I think I, this has been kind of my disenchantment with a lot of the modern pop psychology books. 
And besides the fact that they can't replicate. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. So there's that. The, yeah, they, they, they do these studies that people just can't replicate or don't replicate because it's a terrible way to get tenure. Uh, but then also <laughs> you, you have these books and some of them are legitimately good books, but they yep. come out and they talk about these site concepts and they use, you know, these one or two cherry picked studies, but those same concepts have existed in philosophy for oh, 2000 yeah. years. Oh yeah. And, uh, or even, even, you know, not even that long ago, like I was reading, uh, the book of five rings here by yeah, yep. Miyamoto Musashi and fantastic strategy, life advice book told through the lens of sword fighting, uh, and it's only maybe a hundred pages, but 500 years old, brilliant. Like you yep. get so much more compact, dense knowledge because it survived for that long. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's totally right. And, um, yeah, I mean, there's a uh, two things I want to say about that. So yeah. one is, uh, like, so there's this book I read a couple of years ago that I actually didn't like the book that much, but I find myself like thinking about it all the time. So it must like the concept is powerful. Um, it's called Everything Makes Sense. Uh, and I think the author is Duncan Watts is his name. Um, but basically it's just about how we like post rationalize everything. Uh, so like, yeah, going back to your like psych study thing, it's like if somebody told me something about like, oh, like your brain will operate that way after you see the color blue. I'd be like, yeah, that makes sense because I remember feeling that way after yeah, looking at the color blue. But and, if, and then if they tell you it's actually the opposite, you'd be like, yeah, that makes sense too. <laughs> um, and they actually did like, so like that is... I mean, I, I think you and I at one point had this conversation, but like I used to be the complete opposite way. I used to be like, yeah, humans are mostly rational and then like sometimes we're irrational and, and are doing these things. But yeah, now I'm like, the more time I spend in like looking at even like sales or just like how people get persuaded of things, the more I'm convinced that it's like, it's purely not purely, but like 90% on the post rationalization spectrum. So taking it back to like startups and big companies, um, I think actually that's why like hype matters a lot for startups. So you could have the exact same company on, you know, uh, day one and day 50, but if day 50, you've had like a wall street journal article, a TechCrunch article, you know, a BuzzFeed article about the exact same company, you're going to have, and then you go approach the, you know, same leads that you were talking to before, you're going to have a lot easier time talking to them, even though, uh, you're the, you have the same exact technology. <laughs> it's just that like, they can now post rationalize that you are a company that's innovative, that they should be working with. Um, and so like, I used to think like, Oh man, like all this tech crunch hype, like this is such a messed up part of the system. But I think it's actually like valuable from a sales perspective for companies to chase that. But def definitely valuable. I think we can still question whether it means anything. Right? Oh, I don't think necessarily. I 100% agree with that. Yeah, yeah, like you could. You're probably the exact same company. Right. Uh, and I think I think part of it too is you just can't believe your own hype, and that's where it gets dangerous. Mm, yeah. Um, where you might think like, oh, just because I'm in TechCrunch, like my company now is great. Whereas like you have to know what the reality is, right, on the ground, but. From a sales perspective, it definitely gets people to open up your emails a little bit easier. Uh, well, yeah, the the whole uh, what what's the Feynman quote? Uh, you must not fool yourself, and or the first rule is you can't fool yourself, and you're the easiest person to fool. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I mean, I definitely fell victim to that when I was first working on a startup in Pittsburgh, where there were all these people around who didn't really know how to evaluate these things, but who were telling me that I knew what I was doing. Right. And I very easily fell into that trap of thinking I knew what I was doing and yep. that I was doing well. Yeah. You get on a couple panels, you like get on, you know, whatever. And then it's like, oh man, I must know what I'm doing. Exactly. And, uh, then... <laughs> and actually going back to reading, that's something that I find books to be really helpful for. It's like, especially like older books, you start realizing you're like, yeah, all the thoughts I thought were original are like not at all. Like people have had these thoughts. I'm really not that smart. Um, and actually I find that sometimes it's like I have to temper that a little bit because um, especially if you're in like and I read multiple books at once. So I tend to have like one fiction, uh, one sort of like nonfiction and then one like miscellaneous, which oftentimes end up be, ends up being like lately like um, like mythology or like philosophy or something. Um, just as like a wild card to like change it up a little bit. Um, but like I'll find if I'm in the middle of like three like stellar like masterpiece type books then I'm just like, I suck at everything. <laughs> like, I'm like, I can't write like this. I can't have insights like this. Like, it's just not possible. Like, oh, you know, yeah. these guys are like another level. But then you start reminding yourself that like, wait, 
these guys are like the masters of like all time at this thing. And you only have to compete with the humans that exist today. So you're <laughs> usually, um, at least for business. Uh, so yeah, it's just like, I don't know. There, there's a little bit of tempering, but it definitely helps keep your ego in check when you realize that people have uh, had all these thoughts that you thought were really unique and original. How do you choose which books to read next? Um, sometimes recommendations. Uh, like recommendations are, are pretty important. So like, you know, if you text me about something or like any friend is like, you know, you have to read this, especially if I know that yeah, it might be a chicken and egg problem, but if I know their recommendations are usually on point, um, I'll, I'll pick that up. Sometimes it's also just like, I'll go down um, a rabbit hole. So like at one point I was going down like war history rabbit hole. Um, I've gone down a bit of a Lincoln rabbit hole the past like call it 18 months. I've read like five Lincoln books, I think. Um, yeah, it's just like, I don't know, just like something like just sort of catches. Um, and then if I'm like more sampling, uh, it'll be like, there, there's like certain topics, I guess, you know, you want, like for me, at least I want to learn like more about. So, um, like there's one book I just got, uh, it just came in the mail today. Actually, it's called the image. Um, and I'm blanking oh, on the, yeah, the pseudo advertising yes. in America or something. Yeah. It's like the pseudo events, right? So it's yeah, pseudo events, yeah. yeah, it's from like the eighties and it's basically like, uh, he's, so he's talking about event. I mean, I've only read like the summary, right? So I haven't read the book, but, um, from the summary, it's like, he's talking about, events that are purely manufactured for the media uh even in the like 80s which is when this book was written i think it's like the late 70s actually is when this book was written or something like that um and he's talking about like press conferences uh and then he's like the advent of celebrities which are like people who are famous for being famous um and so yeah it's like i don't know just like it was a book that i'd seen recommended by a couple different people i had um had seen it referenced in a few different uh, blog posts and stuff. And I was like, all right, it's time to pick this one up. Um, just cause like, I think that's relevant to, you know, both what I work on and just to like understanding the world. Um, yeah. So it's just like, I don't know, just like something that like catches my, my curiosity. Um, and you've seen my recommendations, like they're all over the place. Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> well, lots of history though, which I like because that's one area that I fully admit to not being well educated in. Yeah. Well, actually, I'll say something about history. The, the history books that I tend to like are the ones that basically are very sure that they are not accurate. Um, so I love the history authors. So I love the history authors that are basically like um, the surviving record is indicating this, but like we don't have all the records, right? Like, um, and I love when they're very cognizant of that fact because then it's like they're not presenting it as like, this is what happened. It's more like, this is what the evidence says happened. But like, if you look at this evidence, it contradicts that. Like they're, they'll like go into like the nuance of it yeah. because some of it, like, I mean, I'm reading this book right now, uh, actually in preparation for this, this Asia trip uh, coming up in June um, about the uh, history of China. And um, I'd read a similar book or actually by the same author, uh, but about India before I went there for, for a few weeks. And like, I just really liked his style of, um, as John Key, uh, I think that's how you pronounce it, K-E-A-Y. Um, and so in the China book, he's talking about how, you know, like China's history is like thousands and thousands of years old. And he's like, we're basing our, you know, interpretation of what their history is based on like this micro segment of evidence that we've dug up. Um, but there could be all this other evidence that was like on organic materials that got destroyed over the last 5,000 years or like, or is just buried like miles deep. You know, there's like all sorts of like, yeah. That's the thing with the Phoenicians, right? That we thought for a long time that they were just purely money driven and didn't write anything down until we realized they were using like biodegradable papyrus. Mm, yep. So, you, so we just like no lost record. all their records. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's like, um, yeah, it's like the evi what is it? The the evi the absence of evidence isn't the evidence of absence or whatever, right? So yeah, it's just like I don't know, like like if you take so I'm not a big fan of like taking history like like a history book and being like, this is what happened. Um it's mm, like life is too nuanced, right, for that to be to be the case. Um and that's part of why I went down the Lincoln rabbit hole, right? Because um each of the books has a very different perspective. Uh, and there are like, you know, I mean, what he like, his life was very controversial. And of course, like his, his actions as 
a president and like all there's there's views on so many different sides and um like it's not that clear cut so some of those authors are like cognizant of that fact others are like not but if you sort of vary the sources that you're reading from it's you know you can kind of create that nuance for yourself as well yeah do you use do you use books to teach yourself how to do things or is it more for this kind of higher level learning and information I think a bit of both. Like there are some books that like, um, like there's definitely some really good homebrewing books that I, I used, um, that were really helpful. Cause like I, um, maybe this is odd, but I'm not the biggest fan of YouTube, uh, or like video yeah, as I, a format. I'm right there with you. I okay. can't learn via video or lecture. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not good, but it's weird. I'm, I'm okay at podcasts. Like I like podcasts. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't know if I'm good at learning from podcasts. I just enjoy them. <laughs> but that's, yeah, that's fair. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So like, I don't know if I'm learning from podcasts, but the, yeah, for, I just learn better from text than I do from, uh, from video. So yeah, like there are a whole bunch of like learn how to homebrew things on YouTube. Um, I looked at a few of them and I just like couldn't pay attention or like just wasn't really getting that into it. Um, and then I was just like, all right, there's this book that all these people seem to be recommending. Let me grab that. Charlie Papazian's, um, what the hell is the name of the book? Why am I blanking on it? Uh, I will send that to you, Nat. Yeah, we can put it in the notes. Um, but yeah, Charlie Papazian is the author. He's kind of like the the godfather of uh, homebrewing. And um, just has this really awesome, like, learn how to homebrew book that takes you from, like, I've never done anything before to, um, you know, to, like, making award-winning kind of homebrew beers. Um, and the cool thing is that, like, even though I had that book, and I looked at those YouTube videos and stuff like I, my first batch, I still exploded the beer. It didn't work <laughs> out. <laughs> so, uh. um, yeah, I mean, it's just like, I, I think the learning part is like, yeah, you learn some things from reading, but then if you don't try it, like it's not gonna, um, you're not gonna act, at least for me, like I have to like yeah. learn, try, mess up, learn some more, <laughs> try, mess up. Um, yeah, I, I like have not been great at like, learning just from a book, uh, which is ironic because I read a lot. So, I, I mean, I think for tactical stuff, we're all kind of like that. It's very hard to retain knowledge if you don't immediately turn around and teach it to someone or do it yourself. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's a really good point. And it's like, um, it, it's also like, I think part of why school was a little bit difficult for me, um, like in college in particular, not in like high school and stuff, but in college, like for the way chemical engineering at the time was taught in at CMU, uh, was like you did. So the first year, actually, you did uh, like a practical class, which was kind of like the intro, uh, which I liked a lot because they would teach concepts and kind of be hands on in the same class. So it'd be like one day we could be more practical, one day we could be more theory. Uh, but then the next like two full years, there basically like wasn't a lab class. So it was like, we're learning about all these things that are, you know, they're in a textbook. It's like, you know, a variable or an equation. And, but you're just like, at least for me, I had nothing to anchor it to, um, in terms of my like actual day-to-day -day life. And then the next year we get into like these lab classes and I'm like, oh, this makes, this is like really interesting. Like, I wonder how I figure out that variable. And then it's like, turns out it was an equation we learned like two years before. Um, but I would have never connected those two things. Um, so yeah, it was also just like, I, I think like for the school format of book learning even or lectures or um, just kind of theory over over action um, or prioritizing theory over action, I think is f for some people not necessarily the right way to learn. Like definitely wasn't for me. Did you realize that before college or was that something that... No, it was in just... college I realized it. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's also why like I haven't done like or not I haven't done I've like uh skew towards like just trying shit um instead of like thinking about it too much now uh, or at least I try to like that's definitely something I think anyone can fall into the trap of like analysis paralysis but um I try to just like you know it's like if I'm it, like I know I'm not like now at least I feel like I know enough about myself that I know I'm not gonna like learn it by just reading it <laughs> so it's like I just gotta try it um and, and I think that's like the same with um you know even like the 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 uh, latest company I started right like with trying to figure out do people even want this like yeah you can like read a whole bunch of research reports and like trend reports and all this other stuff or you can just like talk to people and then you can talk to people and try to charge them something 
And if they pay for it, you're like, all right, well, now it looks like they actually want it. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it's just like not overthinking it again. Right. Like, uh, but you do want to like know what you're talking about. So that's where I think reading can make a big difference is like can teach you the voc- vocabulary of something, at least for brewing. I found that to be really helpful um, from books was like I-, I did definitely immerse myself a little bit um, to where I had the vocabulary. I had like I did enough batches where I'm like, OK, I can speak as a brewer uh, and people will be like, all right, this guy at least knows something about brewing. Uh, but yeah, like it was it was like definitely prioritizing the action part over the the just like book learning part were you very concerned about your gpa as a student or were you more focused (laughs) on developing these skills (laughs) um i was concerned about it uh (laughs) but that said (laughs) uh it wasn't like it wasn't actually as bad at the end of the day as it seemed like it, it felt i guess in the moment um, yeah. cause in high school, I, like I was a straight A student in high school and then, uh, in college, I remember, so I got, I got one B my first semester, which turned out to be my peak. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, the next semester, I think I got, I think I got one B again, but the GPA for whatever reason, I think I had like one less credit or something. Uh, so the GPA was like slightly lower. So freshman year was pretty damn good. It was also pre like starting college then. So, uh, I, I think those two things are correlated, but then the, you know, the next year, uh, I just obviously had like other things on my mind as well. Um, and other skills I was trying to learn. So I started like not prioritizing school as much, but in the back of my head, I was still like, you got to keep your GPA up. You got to keep your GPA up. Um, and I think my junior year, I just sort of said, fuck it. (laughs) Um, and I got my first D and of all time and only D, you know, like I'm not going back to school. So, uh, my only D, And uh, that was in organic chemistry. And luckily, that was in uh, the chemistry department and not the chem E department, the chemical engineering department. So I was still able to, like, I didn't have to retake the class. Oh, (laughs) nice. Because you need to get a C at least in all your major classes. So, uh, yeah. But the reason I got the D was not because, like, I I, I actually think the subject is pretty interesting. Because, like, I've looked at it since, um, you know, working with Estee. Like, we, we do a lot with, like, organic materials and things. Um, but it's a pretty interesting topic. It was at eight 30 in the morning. Um, it was like purely like the professor was basically reading out of the textbook and it was very heavy on memorization, memorizing things. Um, and I'm just not strong. That's like not my strong suit at all. Uh, especially for something I have no anchor to. Um, I forget who, or maybe I wrote this in my newsletter, uh, actually this past time, but I like have never been good at remembering things I don't care about, but things that I do care about, I can like remember, I can remember sports stats like that. I, there's no reason I should remember them. Um, and I can just like recall them right away. But I think it's cause I have an anchor to those, right? Like there's some type of emotional anchor there. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, it kind of makes sense evolutionarily too, right? Yeah. Where data that you perceive as important, you should hold on to and data that you don't perceive as important is just going to go in one year and out the other. Right. Right? <laughs> That's exactly right. Um, yeah. And then like senior year also my, uh, from the GPA standpoint was like, it was better than junior year. Junior was like my hardest one, but that was also like overlapping with alpha lab and, um, definitely the most time I was spending on the company for sure. Uh, so I think I was basically just like, if I pass, like I'm good with that. Um, but I think like, uh, so the cool thing is that like nobody has ever asked me for my GPA. Like I have had zero questions about uh, my GPA for any job, any kind of like consulting role. Of course not. Nobody cares. Um, but yeah, like it ended up not mattering at all. So it's almost like in hindsight, I'm like, I spent too much time thinking about it. Um, and I, in the grand scheme of things, I didn't spend that much time thinking about it. But it's just like it didn't matter at all. Yeah, I've never been asked for mine either. Yeah. Which has been ni- nicely confirming to my suspicions when I was a student, which is that it only matters if you're going for those entry level college graduate focused positions that come to career fairs and take a thousand resumes and then need a GPA to filter you out. Right. Which sounds like a nightmare, man. Oh like, my God. It's, I, it's, uh, it's kind of like if you're a single person on a Friday night and yeah. you've got all these bars In and you, you just decide <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you just decide I'm going to go to the bar where every single attractive person is. Right. It's like, 
needlessly throwing yourself into the most competitive environment but it's possible. even more but it's also even worse than that too it'd be like if you say we're the the all the most attractive people to the jet like the general consensus of what the most attractive people are uh, oh, yeah, are in this place point. too right because like of your gender yeah of your well i and i would argue too that like uh you know taking it to jobs for a second like the jobs that you won't get recruited for at a career fair are actually a lot more interesting uh, yeah that's in terms true. of like learning and everything i mean from every factor like yeah maybe not necessarily money right like as we talked about but there are uh, i mean but that's not necessarily the case like that yeah i mean are well paid money too yeah i mean yeah, the internship like... i was mentioning that i did at, at booz allen like that was where so i got the internship but then i was introduced to this guy who uh who like he had won this like internal idea competition so he got like a ten thousand dollar budget to basically develop the idea and he was smart and was like, I'm not going to have time to do this. So I'm just going to use that budget to hire an intern. And, um, that intern happened to be me. But like, again, that was not from like applying through like the website or whatever. It was like, there was like somebody who came to campus and then I followed up and like, I mean, it was like definitely like a, someone introduced me to someone kind of situation. Um, and yeah, it's like, but I mean, I got paid well that summer. I got paid probably more that summer than I did like until like four years later. <laughs> yeah, so. a lot of my friends who graduated and went straight to startups where they were, you know, relatively early employees, semi leading some division of it. Like that's definitely comparable pay to a lot of the quote unquote safer jobs. Yeah, and I I think actually, well, let's like break that down too a little bit. Um, sorry, this is something I'm no, feel like please. I'm constantly talking to people about, but um. The whole like safer thing, I do not think is true. Yeah. So let's talk about that. Uh, so yeah, like, I mean, it's, I think there might've been an era where this was safer, right? Like that you could, and and what is this? Uh, like the big company job that you stick in for, you know, 25, 30 years or whatever. Um, kind of what we would, what we would see recruited for at career fairs. Um, I think there was a time that maybe that was, that was safer. I actually think. Like maybe there's like we need to like revise the linguistics, but I actually think this whole idea of uh, prioritizing skills is actually a lot safer. Um, yeah, yeah, because it's like you're not tied to a company. Because things happen to companies. Like, I mean, this is going to be a super obvious example, but like, you know, Enron, for example, there were a few people that did something wrong, right? But like, not everybody in the company did something wrong. They were just like innocent bystanders, but they lost their jobs because there's no more Enron. Um, because of what a few people did, that sounds pretty fragile to me. Um, well, and yeah. especially if those people were employed based on their ability to operate within Enron and its systems, yeah, right. Yeah. If if you're a super skilled designer who's working at a firm and that firm goes bust, like you're probably going to be okay. But if yeah. you're a really skilled, or I don't know if we'd even call it skill, but if you're just very effective at working through the corporate structure and you know being a manager and stuff, it's harder to sell that skill independently. Yeah. And I think Nat, I think you're completely right about that. And I think it's also what you end up getting good at, right? Because like, if you are going to spend like 10 years or 20 years, or you're you're basically going into it thinking this is going to be the company I work for, you're going to figure out how to maneuver the hierarchy and the internal politics. Like you're going to have to get good at that if you want to survive that long. And if you want to move up and like all these kind of things. So, um, and you're going to do that probably at the expense of your like actual skills, like your design skills or whatever else you might be trying to learn. Uh, and you get really good at these internal politics things, which, you know, let's be honest, those are a skill, but those are a skill within a very limited environment because those skills are not going to translate to other companies. Exactly. Um, I so mean, that's yeah. why I think it's so valuable for people to do some form of freelancing or yep. consulting, you know, skill consulting at some point, because once you know how to, you know, like kill your own food, and go out and make money if you need to, that really opens up a lot more doors for you professionally. It opens up a lot of confidence uh, for the person as well, right? Is Definitely. Like, yeah, you you are a lot more comfortable um, maybe taking risks even in, within the corporate environment because that's the other thing I've noticed. Like, It's actually not that easy to get fired in a company. Um, it's really hard. It's yeah. really difficult. Like, You have to really try. <laughs> um, uh, there's a guy uh, who no longer works for Estee Lauder, but he worked in the lab actually had a really good resume. Like he was a PhD from uh, one of the Ivy Leagues, I forget where, um, in biochemistry. And kind of like older guy. 
he would come in. Uh, this is, I mean, it doesn't sound bad at first. He comes in at 7 a.m., right? And he does uh, an hour of meditation. And then, uh, you know, nothing wrong with meditating, you know. Yeah, med- it's all right. If he's coming in at 7 a.m. Comes yeah. in at 7 a.m., uh, meditates. And then out, he goes outside no matter what the weather is, it seemed. I mean, at least the days I saw him there, uh, even if it was like really cold or whatever, he would be outside doing yoga um, in like this like little courtyard type of area. And then so it's 9 a.m. He comes up, uh, you know, to his desk, does about like a half hour of work, then goes down to the cafeteria and gets uh, gets breakfast, uh, comes back around 1030 and he does another meditation session. <laughs> Uh, it's 11. He does a little bit more work. Uh, then he goes and gets lunch. Uh, it takes about an hour lunch. You know, it's not like that unbelievable, but so 1 PM does a little bit of work. Then he has like another meditation, like a shorter meditation session. Then he does work until about three and then at three on the dot, he would walk out and it didn't matter if he was in the middle of a meeting. Like I'd been in, <laughs> I'd been in large meetings where this guy was in the meeting and at three o'clock doesn't matter if somebody is talking. Like oh my he gosh. gets up and leaves. And that guy had been with the company for like eight years. He recently left because uh, he's like at retirement age, apparently. Um, like he's kind of older and uh, got a package, right? So uh, like a retirement package to leave. And so he didn't get fired. He still got a retirement package. That's getting paid not to work. <laughs> um, it's so wild. I mean, because productivity. Easy yeah productivity standards at big companies too are so lax that it's kind of easy to go there and just get in the habit of doing you know not necessarily the bare minimum but like just enough to be good and then yeah and not I, much more and i think going back to what you said too about the freelancing side like you actually don't have the feedback mechanism either so in a lot of cases right because things are sort of um siloed and compartmentalized like you know, the pro that final product is the result of like hundreds of people's uh, work. So if the product flops, it's like not easy to say like, oh, it's because of this person, right? It's like usually a little bit more ambiguous where like, you know, a whole lot of people or the system itself just didn't operate the right way or, you know, some somewhere along the line, something got, you know, messed up. But like when you're doing something on your own or in a very small team, it's like much easier to get the feedback loop of like, okay, well people just don't want this or like my design is just shitty or, um, you know, like it's just much easier to get that feedback loop. And then you just improve because you don't, most people don't want to suck at something. They want to get better. Uh, but if you'd never get that feedback, which like, again, in a big company, it's like somewhat political too, right? What the feedback that you get um, because like, you know, like if you're, if you're terrible, like it's a somewhat polite environment, right? Like people usually, unless, you know, something's completely, completely bad are not going to be like, yeah, that sucked net. Um, they'll be like, nah, well that could use a little bit of improvement. And can you, that to be like <laughs> two weeks, right? And you're like, oh, okay. Like, sure. Um, but it's like two weeks and you still get paid for those two weeks. <laughs> like, you know, uh, it doesn't really, you're going to have three or four meetings to figure out how to improve it. Yeah. yeah. And even if you improve it, like what, like how much time and effort are you going to put into improving it? Because like you, you are now optimizing for getting your boss to basically say like, yeah, this is sufficient because you don't want them nagging you. So you, and you don't want to get fired and you want to get a good review or whatever, but there's not really any upside. <laughs> like, yeah, you're not going to get paid more. Yeah. If you just make a, let's say you made a landing page and it's like, you know, subpar and you know, uh, your boss comes and says like, Nat, I think you can do a little bit better. Uh, in two weeks we'll like review this again. You'll be, you'll spend your time figuring out what you can do to get it to where he's not going to like make you redo it again, but you're not going to make like a baller killer high converting landing page because like, what do you get from that? You you have no incentives. You're not getting any of the upside. Like you said, yeah, the upside, I mean, yeah, like you might get like a plaque or something at the end of the year. (laughs) (laughs) Um, yeah, so it's. I think there's like some incentive things, and uh, but that said though, I actually have found it to be very valuable to see the, the big company from the inside. Uh, again, because I'm not good at learning things secondhand from other people. Uh, so I, even though maybe others had told me things like this, like seeing it firsthand made me like a lot more um, definitely aware of what was go- what's going on within big companies. But then also just like uh, not being intimidated by big companies, as I said before. Right. Uh, this is a little bit of a change of pace, but we talked about it very briefly before, uh, when you were still in school and you were focusing more on 
developing these skills like we've been talking about instead of the GPA. Was that hard with your parents? Um, I think initially. Uh, so there was one. So the next summer after I did the Booz Allen internship, I had um, gotten like a return offer to go back. Uh, and it was even like getting paid even slightly more and um, all these kinds of things. But I wanted to work on on this company. Right. Uh, and obviously this was like pre any kind of traction because we didn't start even trying to sell it to anybody till the fall. Right. So this was the summer. Actually, this was a spring because we were deciding what, you know, internship or what. And um, yeah, I think there were some like heated arguments with my parents about that a little bit. Um, but like, I, I do think though that they were like, it was very, a very short period of time where they were like uncomfortable with it. And then I think they were just sort of like, he's going to CMU. Um, I think the only time they actually got a little bit scared was when I was thinking about dropping out. Um, oh. and I think that, and that happened a couple different times. So I think that yeah. was more uh, scary, but I think like the, the, like pursuing these other skills while I was in school were not that big of an issue. Um, because it was like, okay, well he's going to graduate from CMU. So in their mind, it's like, that's, you know, that's all the insurance or whatever <laughs> that, uh, you need, even though we, you and I know that's not necessarily true at all. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I don't know about your class, but I like, I know people who are still kind of like in very sort of unsatisfactory jobs um yeah i mean the thing that i see more is people kind of getting the job that they worked for for four years and then being kind of unhappy and feeling stuck in it yeah well yeah exactly or like um so feeling unhappy or feeling stuck or actually being stuck like yeah because they just don't have anything to move up right Um, well i I think the more niche the skill set you're that you focused on in college, the easier it is to get trapped like that. I mean, you were talking about, and this kind of relates to the luxury versus commodity, but if you only took, you know, finance related classes because you really wanted to go work on wall street and be an investment banker or something, and then you get there and you hate it, your, your focus is so narrow that it's very, it's significantly harder to transition to other things. You definitely can, but you don't have as diverse of a skill set, so it makes like the switching costs much higher and scarier too. Yeah, and I think that's also part of why people gravitate, I, in, my, in my opinion, to uh, grad school, um, mm. because I think it's like if you feel stuck, it's like, oh, this is another school that can now you know un- like make me unstuck, unstick, um, me. unstick yeah. me. Yeah, exactly. Uh, even though it's like, you know, costs an amazing amount of money, but there's very, people I, I, <laughs> you learn, you learn even less, <laughs> you learn even less. Yeah. There's people I've like, there's, um, you know, I, like I'm sure you also have people, uh, who are applying to grad, like business school or even other types of grad school, um, or are currently in there. And there's like a very small percentage of them that I feel like actually are passionate about what they're studying. Mm-hmm. Um, and the rest are kind of like there to, for the, for the like after rewards of it. Well, that's always what I hear about MBA programs mm-hmm. is that you don't really learn much by going to it. You just kind of get two years to hang out and drink and party and but like network and meet other interesting people. Yeah, so it's I mean, kind like, of like, I mean, like, dude, like think about marketing, like in the era that we live in, where what like the skill set you need for marketing, like, are you going to learn that in a lecture or should you just spend oh, your no, time I... like build a quick site for something and like. Even if it's not anything that interesting, like figure out how to drive traffic to it and like understand what a funnel is and build a landing page. Like it's just like all these skills are so much more valuable. And guess what? You didn't have to pay anyone for it. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's what I tell college students who ask me about learning how to do startup marketing is I'll tell them, you know, major and study psychology, philosophy, writing, something like that. And then yep. just do marketing projects on the side because the the derivative skills like marketing and whatnot you can learn way faster than you can in a lecture, but some of the really foundational stuff like writing and math uh, and thinking and logic, it helps to have a more structured class for it and getting that feedback. Yeah, no, I think that that actually makes a lot of sense. If you, yeah, I think that that makes a lot of sense, but like for grad schools, they're almost all like meant to prepare you for a job or something. Right. Uh, Unless you're doing, you know, a master's in physics, but yeah, yeah, those are totally different. Uh, or like, you know, medical school or something like that. Like Mm -hmm. those are slight, I mean, even that's preparing you for a job, I guess, but, um, like med 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 school people get a pass because they're saving all of our lives. Yeah, exactly. And I I could never (laughs) ever do that. And I have so much respect for people who can get through it and stay in school for that long. Um, Oh yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Although that's an interesting guest idea. Like I, 
have you looked into like the history of like drug approvals and stuff like that before? Well, it, oof, man, we could go way down the rabbit hole on drugs and FDA stuff and doctors. Okay, there's um, some really cool books that uh, you've probably read them too. Like Happy, uh, I think it's called Happy Accident is one of them that was really recommended. And there's is that the one about how basically like most of the popular drugs were discovered on accident? Yeah, and so many of them were just like self tested to see if they worked and stuff. Yeah, like what, what was it? Viagra was supposed to be for heart medication to prevent uh, people from having heart attacks i think think? so something like that yeah yeah that was in that book but yeah it was um i found that to be like really fascinating too the self-testing thing where like i mean talking about skin in the game right (laughs) like if that drug is not safe like (laughs) oh man you're gonna like i mean but that's i mean that is true skin in the game though right like if the person making the drug has to try it like they're not gonna be like well only two percent of people die and then you take this drug it's gonna be like i better you know it better be pretty safe (laughs) i would much prefer that kind of system to you know, what we get stuck in sometimes with drugs. Like, I don't, I don't know. Have you seen some of the stuff coming out recently about ibuprofen? Uh, no, but I stopped taking that a long time. Yeah. Yeah. But what is lo- coming out about it? It looks like, uh, and I'm going to have to dig up the research after and include this in the show notes, but uh, it looks like there's definitely some risks around um, developing like stomach and heart issues from taking it too regularly. Mm. And so now they're adding all these extra labels to ibuprofen to like, make people more conscious about taking it which is pretty crazy because that's something that a lot of people take very regularly right like people pop them all the time like when i used to play uh tennis competitively like i would Mm -hmm. was taking them a lot for just like joint pain or like things like that i mean there's probably like times where i take them for like weeks straight well until i read this research anytime i woke up with the smallest amount of a hangover i would just yeah pop two ibuprofen and be good to go (laughs) (laughs) oh man (laughs) then there's probably more than enough of those (laughs) <laughs> no, no, no. Very, very, very infrequent. Okay, so uh, again, just like changing tracks a little bit, but you mentioned the sleeplessness, uh, which I think ties into this. When you were a student or, you know, post-grad, did you ever deal with any kind of uh, depression? Um, I think definitely the last couple months I was in California. Um and I think part, I mean, there's a whole bunch of factors, but like our company not going the direction we wanted was a big part of that. Um, and then the other thing was also just like being in a new place with only like, you know, I had like a bunch of, I would say professional friends and contacts and stuff. Um, but it wasn't like my core network, right? Like my, my core group of friends was mostly on the East coast. Um, and I think that made a big difference. Right. And And it's like little stuff too, that bothers you where like, you know, you'll text people when, especially because I was going into an office and stuff, right? So I would text people when I'd get back from work and it would be like 6.30 or whatever, um, 7 or something like that. And it's like 10 p.m. on the East Coast. And they're like, oh, just getting ready for bed. And I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Um, You know, it's like that type of stuff that was like a little bit harder, like staying in touch with family, like my family was all East Coast. Um, It was like that, like that made a big difference. So it was more like the support system, I think, wasn't quite there. Um, and I think I like in hindsight, I could have done a better job to to cultivate that. Like people, again, are usually very open and very nice. And I have I definitely had friends on the West Coast at the time, but um, I probably just didn't like open up about this kind of thing when I was there. Um, yeah. So I think like post and postgrad is like very different in terms of even just like meeting people, like whether it's, you know, uh, like girls even or just like meeting um, even just like friends in general. Like in college, you have a very sort of uh, built in. Uh, way to meet people which is like classes you're on all in the same place like you go to the same parties especially a school like cmu which is not that big um so i think i'd gotten very used to that part of it as well where it's like very effortless to meet people um whereas like you know in a real sort of life environment especially when you so i had a commute when i was in um in the bay area so uh you know you're waking up fairly early you're getting back somewhat late and but you know and i i've always been um pretty big into like I like going to the gym and stuff so um just even like you know get back at like 6 30 or whatever go to the gym or like go for a run or something and then it's like eight and then you want to eat food and then it's time to go to bed right like so um there wasn't that much time uh especially during the week to go and like meet a whole bunch of people um but that said like I definitely made some great friends when I was out there and like I'm still really good friends with some of them so um yeah but I would say like that was difficult when I was out there. 
Did you ever develop a better system for meeting people that helped with that? Um, I think like now I go a little bit more out of my way to just like open up about what I'm feeling. Like I use words like I feel a lot more. Um, yeah, I'm just like, I think a lot less closed off than I was at that time. I think part of it's just being aware too. Because when I came back to the East Coast, I think I was, I, I did sort of like self inventory a little bit about that. Um, and just like being aware that that's what I was doing. So like I have, I think a natural tendency and maybe for a lot of people, um, is to like close off when things aren't going well, or you perceive that things aren't going well. Um, so maybe like you'd be invited to things and you'd be like, yeah, I'm not going to go. I'm just not feeling up to it today. Um, but now it's more like if I, if I catch myself doing that, it's more like I will try to kick myself into the opposite reaction and be like, I'll go because I'm not feeling up to it. Um, that's a good little mental hack for that. I like that. Yeah. Cause I almost like, I know it's going to make me feel better. Like I, 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 um, I'm definitely somewhere in between the introvert and extrovert ends of the spectrum. Uh, like I don't think I'm all the way on either end and like, so talking to people sometimes for me will feel like work and sometimes it just depends who I'm talking to. Like, you know, I could talk to you for hours. It's fine. Yeah. Um, (laughs) We usually do. (laughs) We usually do. But, um, you know, there's some conversations where you're just like, like, I don't enjoy talking to people just for the sake of talking to them, if that makes sense. Um, but I also know that like I do in a lot of ways still feel energy from talking to people. Like, and I, I have, I need both, right? Like if I've spent too many days, like I find this now that I, I do a lot of work travel. Uh, and when I do work travel, I am like talking to people seemingly for like 12 hours a day. And I know when I come back from those trips, I just like want to shut myself in a room for like 24 hours and not talk to anybody. Um, so there's a bit of like that as well. But I know that if I did, you know, shut myself in a room for four days or something, I would have such an urge to talk to people and I'd probably start feeling depressed. <laughs> just because yeah. like, I wouldn't have had human interaction. No, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, that was a big thing that I had to figure out too when I went to Austin post grad because I didn't know mm-hmm. anyone there. And you're yeah, right. We had talked about a, that too. Yeah, I remember when you first moved out there. Yeah, it's a big shock going from being in a system where a social environment is kind of handed to you on a platter to one where you have to create it for yourself. Yeah, you got, and that's a really good way to put it. You have to create it for yourself. Um, kind of like everything else that we've talked about yeah, on here. Exactly. Um, but again, there's like people have done it before and there's like yeah. a lot of them talk about it online too. Um, so that's usually free. So, um, exactly. yeah, there's like, I think also a, a lot of it too goes back to like, um, what's the right way to put this? Like, I think at some point it was like at, definitely after I moved uh, out of California, but I started realizing that like, there's not that much like risk of like a you know, social risk for example of like talking to somebody um yeah because people are like mostly in their own heads <laughs> so, <laughs> that's true yeah it's like, like like i don't know have you ever had those times where you're like thinking about what to wear or something and you're like should i wear these pants or these pants and then like you're thinking about it for like 20 minutes and then you realize when you go out you're like nobody cares what i'm wearing because they're all worried about what they're wearing <laughs> well <laughs> like, yeah the what's it called the spotlight effect that we all think that everyone else thinks about us way more than they actually do yeah, exactly. And it, it's always really helpful to ask yourself, like, okay, what was my what what T-shirt was my housemate wearing today, right? Yeah. Or <laughs> what were what were the last three times I remember somebody else doing something embarrassing? Yeah, exactly. And when when you go through those exercises, you realize that you don't remember anything about no. the people around you. I actually just tried to think about those questions as you were answering them. I was like, shit, I can't answer any yeah, of them. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, Man, you're yeah, right. Helps, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it helps. Uh, it really gets you out of like your own head a little, you know, a, a lot actually. Oh, and it makes you uh, so much less insecure about what other people might be thinking about you. Yeah, I think also the other thing uh, related to the like the depression thing was the um, and going back to again like being open. Um, I started realizing that other people had these same uh, thoughts and like struggles too, um, because I think we and I don't want to only blame social media for this because it's not only social media's fault. We you know humans have always had this, but. Um, we compare ourselves to like what we see other people doing. And I definitely remember, especially like both startup experiences with college then and with mom trusted, like I assumed everybody else was doing incredibly well, um, like both their companies and as individuals and like was super happy and like life's great. And like, I think also, um, 
like in the startup world, we maybe not as much anymore, but there was definitely a time where everybody was like, I'm crushing it. Um, and you know, in high, like in reality, they're like, they need to make payroll on Friday and like they might <laughs> make it. Um, so yeah, there was a lot of this, like, I don't know. I felt like I wasn't able to be open with people too. Cause I just perceived that, Oh, everybody's doing better than me. So I don't want to be like the one person at the table who's like, yeah, shit's not as good as I, you know, as you guys like, you know, like nobody wants to be that person. But then I, I started like having more real conversations and it was usually, I think early on it was other people were opening up to me. And then I was like, okay, well I'll open up too. Um, and you know, you start finding out like other people are going through these same exact things. And like, most companies are actually struggling and like people are, you know, they might get like some initial traction and like raise around, but then it's like really hard to get to the next step. And, um, yeah, it's just like, you start realizing like your problems are not unique and, uh, there's definitely some comfort in that because, you know, you don't want to be like, Oh, I'm the one dumb guy in San Francisco and everybody else is making a billion dollars. Um, but yeah, well, that's why, I mean, that's why I like bringing up that question on a lot of these interviews because I know that it was something that I struggled with for a while. Pretty much everybody that I've talked to around some of you know these people who have done uh, some of the things that you've talked about, other entrepreneurial things, even going after uh, more typical job routes. It's a very yep. common thing yeah. to experience, but people don't talk about it openly that often. Yep. But when you do, I mean, I find that people tend to respond very positively to talking about it. They're just waiting for somebody else to breach the subject. That's exactly right. I mean, I've never seen an instance where someone was like, oh, you you suck because things are going bad. Like nobody, I've never, I mean, maybe it's happened to somebody, but it's not happened to me. Um, and then, I mean, the other thing that's helped too is uh, like, I didn't know anything about stoicism until uh, like I had moved out of California. Um but I think that like that would have helped a lot too. You're you're an Epictetus guy, right? Um, I'm increasingly becoming a Seneca person. Okay. Uh, I have uh, Seneca. Everyone, everyone has their desk. own team that they. Everyone has their own. Team I was originally. Um, uh, I mean, I still am in, in a lot of ways like a, a meditations person. Okay. Because I think also partially like it's hard to know like what variables are you know being conflated. But it was the first Stoic book that I read was yeah. meditations um, well, and we should probably explain we're talking about yeah. basically the yeah. three major kind of like second round of stoic books so meditations by marcus aurelius letters from a stoic by seneca and then like discourses by epictetus right yep, yep. yeah yeah um so I, I don't know if i really like that one because it was the first introduction to those concepts mm -hmm. uh and i just was like had my mind blown by them uh or you know it could it could be that it's actually you know that amazing but um, I'm starting to be more like Seneca, uh, like more Seneca, uh, team Seneca, I guess, uh, just because, <laughs> we'll, just get, because we'll get shirts. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> just because I think like, so, uh, looking at meditations and, and letters again, it's like meditations, I feel like focuses a lot on political behavior and of course, you know, human interaction. Uh, but he was, you know, the emperor. So <laughs> it makes sense that he's focusing on that. Um, and Seneca has a really good way of sort of like tying like the practical like business type of uh sense into the philosophy or the other way around i guess well he, he um, covers such a broader range, such a broad of issues. range of topics yeah yeah i th I think the greatest thing about meditations is that you can read it and you can see a lot of your own thoughts mm -hmm. in the writing yep right like trying to deal with people criticizing you or uh being rude to you and then you realize that that the guy writing it was literally the most powerful person in the world yeah. at the time. Yeah. So it would yeah. be kind of like if we stumbled upon, you know, Obama's diary and he had these entries like, you know, don't be rude to the Republicans today. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> they're fighting their own problems too. Yeah. And it's like, and you can, the, the other cool thing that I really liked about it was it was like his reminders to himself. And there were some instances yeah. where he's like, you didn't do that yesterday. <laughs> like, <laughs> like do better than yesterday or something. And, um, and yeah, you're like, you're like, yeah, okay. Like, so he's not perfect, you know? Um, exactly. Yeah. I think that's also the other thing too, like that I really liked about stoicism was, uh, or still, you know, love about stoicism, which is, um, more than anything, I don't know, just made me both aware that like, these are human problems, not Neil problems. Um, right. and like everybody in all ages and eras has like had these same exact issues, um, just because we're all human. And then, uh, the other thing is just like, um, and this one is like, I, I haven't heard that many people say that this part of stoicism is interesting to them, 
But I really like the like negative projection uh, technique, which are you familiar with that? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's so useful. Go ahead, explain it. Yeah, the, it's basically where you kind of imagine like what the worst possible outcome is of what you're about to do. Um, and then you like in most cases, at least you're like, that's not actually that bad. And you feel a lot better about it. Um, but it's basically like kind of imagine like positive visualization of what an athlete would do uh, before like a game or a match. And then picture like the opposite of that, where like they can't even figure out how to like throw the ball properly or, you know, they get sacked every single play. Uh, and yeah, it's like basically what is the worst that could happen. And then you play that out in your head. Uh, well, I was I was talking about this with a friend earlier today, and I kind of did a version of that in college when I was getting more interested in this entrepreneurship work. Yep. Where I just tried to see how low of a cost of living I could live at for a little while. Because that would give me a barometer of, you know, okay, I actually only need this amount of money to be comfortable. Exactly. That's a really right. good way of doing it. Yeah. And then it's like anything above that is amazing, right? It's just extra. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I like, I don't know. I just find that helpful to like um, not overthink <laughs> things again out of fear. Uh, and it's or, useful. Or not for, talk yourself out of things. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like, I mean, it's like, um, I mean, for me, one of the things I, I have always struggled with is like, I don't like looking, um, looking dumb and, yeah. uh, or like just looking like, like, you know, a fool or whatever and what I'm talking about. And really, cause I thought everybody liked that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 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 um, but yeah, it's like, you know, it's like, let's say I'm about to have, uh, and anytime I'm entering a market, I always, like a new industry, uh, whether it's like beer or even with like the early education or higher education or whatever, uh, I learn a lot just by talking to people in the industry. And I always, always have that thing in my, like, kind of like in the pit of my stomach of like, you're going to sound like an idiot. And then half the time I'll like procrastinate doing those calls, even though I know they're going to take my like level and industry knowledge to like the next level. Um, I, I just like, will keep hesitating. And then I've found that ever since I kind of discovered this, um, not discovered, but learned about uh, this like negative projection thing, it, it, you're just like, all right, what's the worst that can happen? This like one of, you know, a, 20,000 like preschool owners says like you're an idiot and then hangs up the phone on you like is that really that bad that's not really that bad um so yeah it's like kind of just like projecting that out helps and I found it for like public speaking and stuff too is uh you know really really helpful I think you had a good post about uh what was it called slaying the lion or something yeah 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 turning fear and anxiety into excitement yeah I found that like it's kind of like both of those, right? So it's like you, you picture like what's the worst that can happen and then you're like, I'm going to go destroy that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, and it's changing that whole like fight or flight um, mechanism in your favor. And so much of the time when you actually dig on dig in on the worst case scenario, it's, it's not, not it's, it's nothing. <laughs> yeah, right. exactly. It's like, oh, uh, yeah, I'm not going to send this cold email because they might not respond or they might be rude. It's like, so what? All right. I'm not yeah. going to approach this. I'm not going to approach this cute person because they might say no. Right. right exactly. So what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, like, uh, so I'm leaving the, um, the, the estate consulting work actually at the end of June. I don't even know if I told you that, but, um, like, and to go work on, on unlimited brewing company and like, I even still, even though I know all this stuff, right? Like, uh, or think I know all this stuff, like a couple weeks of indecision were definitely there because I mean, one, I'm not great at saying no to money. Like that's something I'm trying to get better at. Um, where I'm always just like, I think I can do both of these things or th all three of these things or all four of these things <laughs> and I'll be fine. Um, so I'm trying to get better at that. And then, you know, cause the estate contracts, uh, are definitely the best paying thing I've ever done. And, uh, but the, like, but I know like, you know, I'm, I'm very comfortable with where unlimited brewing company is right now and, and kind of doubling down on that. And, um, you know, like I still had some of that sort of like fear of like, Oh man, like what if this doesn't work? Like, and then, so I did kind of that like negative projection thing, like, all right, let's assume like, okay, I leave the job at the end of June. Uh, I'm working on this company. And like three months later I realized like, yeah, nobody actually wants this. And like all the people who said they wanted it, like are totally just making it up to mess with you. And, it you you know it all goes wrong and there's nobody who actually wants this but i still like learned something really cool about a, an industry that's pretty hot right now and it actually is an interesting model in a whole lot of other industries as well like this whole you know latent manufacturing capacity idea um and then maybe there's another industry that i could go apply it to so it's like you know even if the worst case thing happens like it's not that bad but when you're before you do that exercise though it like feels like this giant knot of like 
horrible stuff. But until you like unwrap that and you're like, ah, actually, there's, there's nothing here that's actually that scary. Yeah. And going back to what you were saying before about optimizing for learning, even in these cases where something fails, like you said, you've learned so much, yep, right? Exactly. I mean, that's almost how I've thought about doing this podcast because <laughs> as should probably be obvious to the people who are listening to it, I'm mostly interviewing some of my really interesting friends first, right? And worst case scenario, I have these awesome conversations with you and Adil and Taylor and Charlie and all these people, right? Yeah, which, I mean, right. we were overdue for a catch-up session anyway. So Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, no, but it's like, I think uh, that's exactly right. And then you're learning about, okay, what's the audio equipment that's necessary? And like, how do I promote a podcast and like organize, you know, before guests get on, how do I make sure like, you know, everything's kind of all set up properly. And it's made me much more self-conscious about my verbal tics too. <laughs> so that's useful. Yeah, that's, uh, I'm sure. Yeah. And that's going to make you a better uh, speaker in general too, like for anything you end up doing later. Exactly. Changing tracks again, just a little bit. <laughs> you mentioned offline before we started this, that there was a lot of value to you to putting yourself into ridiculous or at least ridiculous seeming to other people projects mm -hmm. that stretch and teach you. And you mentioned by Dem Hornets. Yep. So what was, what was that? So I did, um, and this is again, another time where I was doing things other than school. Um, I did a like unpaid internship with a company called group gain. Uh, which does not exist anymore. Uh, but it was kind of around that whole like Groupon era. Um, and actually, I think they were somewhat ahead of their time with the idea where basically their idea was like kind of like crowdsourcing, but basically where uh, you would have a company, uh, let's say, this is a stupid example, but I'm, it's one that comes to top of mind. Like if you could in one go buy 50,000 iPhones at the same time, uh, instead of like Apple having to reach in each individual co consumer, um, you would in theory be able to negotiate a lower rate for those 50,000 people um, for being part of that and sort of pre-committing. So almost like think of like Kickstarter, I guess, ish, but for like existing products and not for like brands maybe that were as established as Apple. Um, it's kind of like group buying is what they called it. But anyway, um, they were trying to figure out like, how to grow from a social perspective and um, just basically bring out awareness. Right. And they had like no budget. It was like the founder self funding it. Um, I think they might've had like a few angel investors or something, but not a whole lot of money. Um, and then kind of like coincidentally, I saw like, I'm a sports fan. So I saw that the um, new Orleans Hornets at the time, now they're the Pelicans, but um, the Hornets at the time they uh, went bankrupt. So their owner had to, like give up the team and it was now like at that time owned by the NBA, which like, I, I mean, I wasn't the only person saying this. There's a whole lot of people who said it. It's like a colossal conflict of interest <laughs> for the league to like own a team that's playing in games oh, um, yeah. <laughs> that they are also officiating. Right. It's just like, I don't know. It just is seems weird to have that. Um, but the problem was they couldn't get a buyer for the team. So I'm actually, uh, like for football, I'm a, uh, and I'm not a Hornets fan or a Pelicans fan or whatever, but, I, you know, I just saw this happening um, in the NBA. It was kind of hard to not see it happening. And uh, for football, I'm a huge Green Bay Packers fan because my dad actually, uh, when he came to the U.S. from India, went to Wisconsin, so the University of Wisconsin. Um, and then I've kind of been ingrained in that Green Bay Packers tradition since I was born. Um, but they are the only sort of major professional sports team in the U S that is owned by the fans. Um, so in, I forget what year is in like the thirties though, it was a, like super long ago. Um, they went bankrupt and the town sort of came together to, to save them and basically bought stock in the team. Um, and they've kind of done that since then. So like to fund like stadium, uh, builds and to, um, fund like renovations and stuff like, they'll sell additional stock to, to individuals. There's no dividend on the stock. Like you can't like, there's not really an open market kind of thing, but it's more just like the fans get, um, you know, the sense that they like contributed to the team, essentially, essentially like crowd funding the team. Um, there might be some like prioritization for like season tickets and things like that. Um, but you know, you don't really like get a share of the profits or anything for by the Hornets. When they went out of business, I was like, okay, if they're having trouble finding an owner, like why couldn't 
the city uh, residents or people who are fans of the team like kind of do a similar concept. And even better, they could do a similar concept on group gain. Um, so essentially, group gain would organize the buying of, of the Hornets. And we actually ended up doing some pretty cool stuff. So again, I didn't know like anything about anything at the time in terms of like growing uh, and, you know, any kind of like this type of stuff. But we got on like local media, we got like Chris Paul, who was at the time, uh, you know, their biggest star on, on the Hornets. We got his like foundation tweeting about it and like people talking about it. There was uh, even like a TV uh, segment that was done on the ground. So we basically, obviously like the company isn't based in New Orleans and stuff. So like it would have been really kind of strange for the company to be publicly leading it. It just happened to be on their platform. Um, but we partnered with some people on the ground. So there was like a really popular Hornets blog. Uh, we partnered with their owner uh, to do it. There were like a few local businesses that, um, you know, we got to help us kind of promote it as well. Um, and yeah, it was just like, it was my first introduction to like BD, for lack of a better word, for business development, um, where like you work with other people who have audiences or, you know, something you need um, to to kind of advance a cause. And uh, yeah, it was just like an incredible learning experience, but it's pretty ridiculous to think that like from a dorm room in Pittsburgh as a sophomore in college to be like, we're going to try to like crowdsource buy an NBA team. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, but that was just like a really cool thing. And it also just like from a confidence perspective was like uh, just very empowering. Like you could to see that happen from, you know, I'm sitting, I mean, you know, the CMU dorms are sitting in Moorwood in my double and uh, sitting at my desk and like talking to like a reporter in New Orleans like about this campaign like it's just like to my you know I think I was 20 at the time yeah because I couldn't drink I was 19 or 20 and uh <laughs> not that I how do you know you couldn't drink at the time <laughs> I mean, were I you drinking in this scenario no I just I don't remember going to bars that year Oh, okay. like, uh, yeah, I was just trying to think like when I lived in Moorwood, I was like, what did I do in the evenings and on weekends? Um, hmm. yeah, so I wasn't like, I definitely wasn't like going to Phi <laughs> that year. So that's how <laughs> I remember. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was like, just, I just kind of remember feeling like, holy shit, the internet is awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think we all kind of have moments like that, right. Where like, you just have this moment of like, holy shit, I can, like, I can reach to anybody I want um, yeah. this thing and like yeah it's just like it was very empowering to, to have that but it's also ridiculous and it didn't work for a whole bunch of reasons um, and but I still like learned a ton so yeah it was still yeah. a fun experience right yeah exactly <laughs> uh, so kind of uh, on the note of like being back in that college environment, if you were to go back and still have some of the knowledge that you have now, do you think you'd do anything differently as a student? Uh, I definitely would have taken a leave of absence when we got into Alpha Lab. Oh, uh, okay. Because I think at the time I was really concerned about like not graduating on time. Um, but like graduating one semester later in the grand scheme of things would have been like not that different. Um, and I think like having the ability to kind of go full hearted into something like that with a budget, which we had at that point, um, with like full attention would have been a pretty interesting thing. Like even just from a learning perspective, even assuming the same exact outcome, uh, we would have gotten there a lot quicker, I think. Uh, and then potentially still had a pivot left, right? Because basically like we were out of cash and we needed a pivot, um, which is a tough position to be in. So um, whereas when you come in and if you can invalidate your idea within like the first few weeks, which I, I actually think we could have, if, if we were paying a lot more attention to it, um, we just still had probably like, you know, 20 K or whatever left over. And it's not a whole lot of money, but you can, I mean, you can restart a little bit with, you know, more, even more, like less than that amount. Um, but if you have like no money, you're burnt out and you need to get a job because you're about to graduate, like it's really tough to execute on a, on a pivot at that point. And you're still in school. <laughs> so um yeah i think that's like that's one uh yeah i mean the other thing i think i would have like more consciously tried to develop these outside skills um because a lot of it uh and you're probably hearing this in the background too of like of of all the things i've done a lot of it in college especially was just like purely random um and i think there's obviously benefit in in doing that but 
um, there's a couple of things like I would have probably spent a little bit more time uh, programming than I did. Um, like I learned a, a bit of Python. Uh, I mean, I got decent at Python, but um, then I didn't do it for like a few years because, you know, we did like the CS class and then we started doing MATLAB in uh, chemical engineering classes. But like not that's not web based at all um, or app based, actually. And uh, I think I would have just spent like more time consciously like learning those things, even if I didn't end up doing those as a career, like even if everything still turned out the same. Um, that would just be like something I would maybe spend a little more time on and less time, even less time than I did <laughs> in class. <laughs> you, you don't I mean, you don't do much programming stuff now from what it sounds like. No, so why do you say no, that you'd want to do yeah. more? Yeah, well, I think it's more just like I understand uh, enough of the basics to speak about it, but there are definitely still conversations I have, especially this is probably more in the essay work. Um, but there's definitely conversations I have where like I don't fully understand what the other side is talking about, uh, where I need to, and most people will ask like, you know, they're okay with answering clarifying questions and stuff, but it's just like you do feel like the other person you're talking to has like, a significant advantage over you on a technical standpoint. So like, especially that comes into play more on like a negotiation, right? So it's like when you're talking about how long something is going to take or how much you're going to pay for something, um, it, it like, there's a chance the other person could be pulling a fast one on you. Right. Uh, uh yeah. If they're like, well, this is going to take, you know, $60,000 to do. And really there's like a plugin they're using. Uh, yep. to do it right so like yeah it's like that type of stuff where there have been a few instances where i'm like i wish i knew what they were talking about um but that said like that would have been at the expense of other skills so you know who knows uh no i mean that that definitely makes sense and it's it's also hard too because it's like maybe some of that stuff that we don't think was useful is useful in ways that are like really hard to pick out in retrospect right yeah I mean, there are, there's one specific thing from chemical engineering that I, like, I think is pretty valuable, um, for me at least, which was uh, like the systems level thinking. Okay. So we used, that. Yeah. Um, so we used like these diagrams called flow diagrams, which basically are showing how like different things go in and out of an overall system. Um, and that I can send you a, a link to like an image of yeah, one, that would be if cool. that would be helpful. Um, but yeah, it's basically, it's like showing like, okay, like, you know, carbon and oxygen go into the system. And then there's a whole bunch of units that are modifying those, whether it's like a chemical reactor or, you know, a heat exchanger or, you know, there's like all these different ways that a system is built. Um, and then on the other side comes out like the product and then there's like waste streams and you just get good. Actually, I, like, honestly, for me, I found that to be really helpful when I think about like funnels on websites. Um, mm -hmm. Because funnels are like really simple versions of flow diagrams. Uh, yeah. Because there's only like, yeah, it's like it, there's not like 50 variables uh, or sorry, not 50 variables, but 50 like inputs and outputs. It's like people come into the site and then how many of them convert? And I was like, oh, OK, this is basically a flow diagram, but just a lot simpler. <laughs> um, yeah. So, I mean, like I found that to be useful and it was more of sorry, it was less of like the chemistry part of it and more of like how you think through uh, things moving in a system. Um, and I think I actually am doing, or I do actually some of the same things when I'm looking at like a new industry. So like whether it was like higher ed or uh, early education or even like with the beer industry, it's like the consumer pays, you know, 12 bucks for a six pack or something. Where does that money flow? Who gets what piece of it? Um, and then what are you like, what is that 12 bucks going towards, right? Like how much profit in each layer of the system? Um, and then ultimately how much is like the brewery actually getting. So it's like, there's definitely like, you're right. Like some type of foundational skill that came with that. Um, Cause I was definitely not always like that. So there's, you're right. There was probably something that I picked up during those years, but it's like harder to put a finger on like exactly what class did that. I mean, I think about that with the philosophy degree a lot where it's, you know, I've never needed to know what Kant thought Kant thought or said, right. But the ability to, you know, construct those arguments and think logically kind of ends up applying to a lot of different skills, especially the, some of the writing exactly. uh, and content marketing. That's exactly right. Yeah. That's actually a skill that, um, I think that like in the professional world you use so much, right. But like, it's not really that focused on in school. 
Yeah, you would never learn how to do it unless you took a very analytical history class or a logic class or a philosophy class. Mm -hmm. I mean, most subjects just never touch on it. Like how to construct an argument or something? Yeah, and how to, you know, argue a point, right? As opposed to just like talking about what the teacher wants to hear about. Right, but it's so valuable. It's so valuable, yeah. Yeah, Just like not really taught. uh, I would say to most people who go to college, like just never get that. Yeah. Well, and I think too, I mean, speaking about philosophy classes in particular, there's the entry level 100 philosophy classes where it's just kind of like walking through a museum and then you see like, oh, Socrates said this and Aristotle (laughs) said this. And that's not really a philosophy class. It's like only until you get to the 200, 300 level when you actually have to argue against the professor for a Mm. certain interpretation and point and write those kinds of essays that you start getting the real benefits. And I always, I always hated the museum tour classes. They were so boring. Do you think those museum tour classes were necessary to get you to the the 200 level ones or the 300 level ones? Like besides prereqs, right? Like forget that for a moment, but no, I I don't think they were necessary at all Yeah, because you just kind of memorize a few facts and ideas, but yep. you don't really understand them until you have to try to argue in defense or against them. Yeah, I think also uh, just off that concept of memorization, mm-hmm. like we went to school, I think, in a really weird time where like you and I and people our age, uh, we knew that Google was a thing, right? Like it's not that yeah. like it was something Wikipedia. that... Had, yeah, exactly. It wasn't like something that had yet to be invented. Like I, maybe if people went to school in like the 90s, yeah, okay, the internet existed. But mm-hmm. like finding things wasn't that easy. So like you might not have put two and two together that like, oh, this internet thing is going to change memorization. Like it's not going to be valuable anymore. Um, whereas like when we went to school, it would like drive me nuts. I'm like, why can't I just Google this? Like if I can't remember the formula but I know how to construct the problem. Like, why am I being penalized for not remembering? This? Oh yeah. Like this makes no sense. Well, um, and it's so absurd yeah. too, because this idea that, Oh, well people in the real world who are good at things don't Google this stuff is insane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was actually uh, talking to my brother. Actually, you should have him on at some point, but um, he was talking about his, like, uh, like his lo- like real life software engineering versus like what professors thought oh, it was yeah. gonna be. Um yeah. and he's like he's like, yeah, I'm like a master Googler. <laughs> like, <laughs> and but he's like, there's nothing wrong with that because what you're doing is like you're searching for various ways to solve a problem and then you're trying different ways to do it. And like, but there's that is actually what you need to be learning. Like how do you go do that? Um so it's like it's like the meta learning, right? You know, yeah. how do you learn how to use all the information available to you to do this task? Yeah, and actually um Something well, like a follow up question actually for you on that, mm-hmm. like uh, and it probably ties a lot to like the stuff you've written about marketing. But like I've been thinking about recently when someone like tries to teach something, it I find that it like there's definitely something that gets lost in translation because they might not be fully aware of all the things that they're doing. Yeah, I think I saw something about I think I saw something about like Michael Jordan teaching basketball or something, and it was like Michael Jordan does not know all the things he does on a basketball court. Yeah, well, that's uh, it's the curse of knowledge, right? That the more experience you become at something, the more you forget what it was like to be a beginner. Mm. Also, do you think you're also sort of like internalizing a lot of processes? Oh, definitely. That, yeah, because I, I, I mean, I'm consulting a couple of companies right now on SEO and content stuff, and like every day it's sort of a realization that you just sort of forget that you know things. And that's one of the hardest things with uh, teaching a skill definitely is trying to figure out what you have forgotten that you used to not know and what's not obvious. And, And also in conversations like this, right? Where a lot of the things that we're talking about are really ideas that we've internalized, but do they make sense to somebody who hasn't internalized some of them? Like hopefully, Maybe not. Yeah, maybe right? some of them, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's a, a, it's really a very point, real though. challenge. Yeah, it's a really, and and um, I mean, there's a there's a group within Estee Lauder uh, called Gen Next, which is like their, um, kind of like their internal, like, uh, not millennial, but like their, I guess maybe under 30 is the cutoff. But like, it's like an employee research, resource group. So it's not like a department or anything. Um, but they, they were able to get like, sort of small budgets to test like interesting concepts that they have and whether those budgets are used for like building prototypes of different things or 
what I'm pushing for is like building landing pages and uh, seeing if people actually want those concepts that they've come up with. Um, so they, I, like, I was doing like a session with a couple of the teams about like how to actually go about doing that. And there were so many things that I was saying that like they would stop me and ask a question and I'd be like, oh, why? Like, why would I assume that they know that? Like, for example, I was talking about like, I like, completely glossed over like buying a domain, right? <laughs> I didn't mention that. And they were like, well, like, how do you get the website? And I was like, I, like, I didn't understand what they were asking until like they asked it a couple different ways. And then I was like, oh, do you mean how do you get like that dot com? Yeah. They're like, yeah. And I was like, oh, like, you don't know how to do that. I didn't realize that. Um, and it's not a condescending thing. No, it's, it's not. Just... It's just like that. It's just a never, they've never had to do it. Um, and it's like, I'm sure the, it's the exact same thing where like if somebody was teaching me a new skill and it probably happens like all the time, um, where like, I don't know how to do something fundamental and like, there's no way I would know that that's a fundamental thing unless someone told me. Um, well, yeah. I mean, one thing I've tried to get better about is not being self-conscious asking those questions. Mm. Cause I think it's really easy to be in a situation with someone who, knows a lot about something and you want to appear at least half intelligent. And so you don't ask all the questions that you want answers to. That's smart. Yeah. Cause they, they'll be able to answer it probably. Oh yeah. But, they'd be probably like totally happy to explain it. Yeah. But if you can get over some of that cognitive dissonance around seeming, you know, uneducated or unintelligent, you'll learn so much more and it'll probably be really fun for them too. Cause I don't know about you, but when somebody is legitimately interested in really going deep and understanding what you're talking about, that makes you feel so good. Yeah, it does. It's like actually one of the best feelings. Like it's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we, <laughs> we are coming up on three hours, yep. which is pretty much about how long I expected that you and I would end up talking. <laughs> um, exactly. We we still we still have some good like wrap up questions here that we can we can touch on. One that I wanted to come back to is that you alluded to before that there are some podcasts where you'll just you'll even go back and listen to all the back episodes. Mm -hmm. uh, which podcasts are those? Uh, so Jocko podcast definitely. Um, Jocko's amazing. The uh, Tim Ferriss I haven't gone through all of them because there's a ton of them, but uh, I've gone through like definitely more than more than I would have expected to like where um, I'll try out an episode, not because I've heard of the guest, but because like, I'm like, Oh, if, he, if they're on, you know, Tim's show, it'll be interesting. Um, and then a lot of times it is interesting. Um, actually, that's how I first listened to Jocko. Of all yeah. Things. Uh, yeah. I had, well, that was how him. everyone first listened to Jocko. He went on T Ferris and Joe, Joe Rogan. Rogan and yeah. then yep. that was basically all the exposure he needed to hit New York times. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so I, uh, I I like saw the name. I was like, I've never heard of this guy, but then I was like, yeah, he's on Tim's show, so I guess I'll check it out. And then I was like, blown away. Um, and then he started a podcast, right? Like not too long yeah. after that. Um, so yeah, those are those are two. Um, oh, Dan Carlin's um, what is his podcast called? Hardcore history. Hardcore yeah. history. I love that podcast. But you can't access all the archives though without paying for them. But yeah, he puts some behind smart. the paywall, right? He's smart. Yeah, I'm still working my way through. So I actually started uh, his podcast really late, like started listening to it in like February. Um, so I listened to he has that Blitz episode, which is like four hours long. I don't know. He says short for him. Um, it's basically about uh, nuclear weapons. And uh, the thing that's really cool about it is because it's a podcast instead of a book, like you're actually hearing like the speeches that were made and the conversations people were having because there's recordings of them. Um, so like that, I found that to be really cool. And, you know, I mean, we talked about history before, like find that really interesting. And Dan Carlin is amazing at telling you about the fog of history, like and where the evidence is like not quite clear or like, you know, it's based on a very sort of small amount of evidence. And it's like, he's like, yeah. this could be totally different. Um, so yeah, I'm working on like the King of Kings one right now, which is about like the, um, the Herodotus, uh, like account of the Greek and Persian wars, uh, which is like, he does a really good job with it. So yeah, that's another one. Um, I'm just pulling up my podcast here. Uh, Joe Rogan, I go through, like if I see a good guest, um, I listen to like, I mean, I always find his podcast entertaining, but it's also like, a if I have, like if I'm, if I have time to listen to podcasts, like 
I don't always listen to Joe Rogan's. But that's true. His, his are an investment if you're doing four three-hour episodes exactly. a week. Yep. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, Sam Harris, I've listened to a few here and there in the archives. But, um, yeah, I mean, those are, like, the big ones. There's, uh, yeah, those are, like, the big ones, I think. And then there's, like, episodes here and there. Um, if you see, like, you know, someone talking about an episode on another podcast that you'll check out. But those are, like, the ones that I look at a lot. Or like, like more religiously, I would say. Like, if they release a new episode, I'm like, all right, I'll, I'm going to listen to this. And, we, I mean, we've definitely talked about a few examples of this. But do you have a favorite failure or fuck-up? Just <laughs> sometime when something went completely <laughs> wrong, but you learned a lot from it? I would say, like, there's, I mean, they're all, they've all been, like, really valuable. Um, one that was like a fuck up, but it was more like, like it was a fuck up that would have, uh, or should have probably like completely changed my opinion on this hobby. But I think I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but the first time I ever brewed, um, I was making oatmeal stout, which is still like, I still think it's a pretty hard beer to make because you're using like multiple types of grains and it's a little bit tricky getting like the right temperature. None of those things were ended up really mattering because, um, so I like, I put the beer for fermenting. I messed up a whole bunch of things in the boil and the uh, and the mash, but we'll, we won't even go there. Uh, put the beer to ferment, and I got impatient because I'm like somewhat impatient as a as a person in general. Um, and I was like, well, I'm not going to wait for ten days like the instructions say. I'm going to like bottle this thing after seven days. Um, and it was still fermenting, but I added my bottling sugar, put it in the bottles. Oh. Um, the bottles didn't explode. I still don't know how. Uh, and for people that don't know, like when uh, when yeast are fermenting sugar for beer or for wine or for anything um they produce alcohol and carbon dioxide and that carbon dioxide is like the bubbles in beer so if you put that in a closed bottle um where air cannot escape and you over carbonate there's a, a chance the bottle will turn into like a grenade <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh i opened up the first one because you know you're supposed to wait like seven days or, or a few days at least after you um you bottle it so that it's actually carbonated and you can't tell from the outside. Like when you're just looking at the bottle, you can't tell that it's about to explode. So I open up the top in my kitchen and it just turns into this gusher of oatmeal stout, like oatmeal <laughs> like stout. hitting the ceiling. Yes. Like, Oh my gosh. Everywhere. And it's like, <laughs> and yeah, man, it was just bad. And then I, uh, so then for the next one, I thought maybe oh, it was just a bottle, right? I didn't know like it, it could be across the whole batch. Then I go, um, I go outside to open up the other one just in case. Same exact thing happened, um, and it was just a mess. And so it happened. It was like every single bottle. But at the time, I didn't know it was because I bottled too soon. I assumed like like I didn't assume anything actually. I was like uh, I, I basically was like I have no idea, um, and I assumed like that I had messed up somewhere obviously. <laughs> um, and then actually, I found it to be really useful because uh, like the troubleshooting part, right? So I went through like all these things that could go wrong. I was like reading about them in that book I was mentioning earlier by Charlie Papazian. He has like a troubleshooting section. And I was like reading through all of them. Like, no, this doesn't mean this doesn't seem to match like what happened. Um, the most common thing, uh, that people say happens early on is like the batch gets infected, um, with like another type of bacteria. But the thing is you'll get a weird odor with that, which I wasn't getting. So after a while I was like, okay, the only thing it could be is this, uh, you know, I, I bottled it too early and I probably added too much bottling sugar, um, in the process. So, uh, yeah, I just found it to be like really useful, but it would have also been very easy at that point to be like, I'm never brewing beer again and beer sucks and I'm just going to buy it. And like, yeah. <laughs> that's it. But, um, yeah, I think like, I think it's my favorite because I like kind of stuck with it at a time when, you know, at the very beginning, it's very easy to quit. Um, cause you're not like invested in it. Like I hadn't spent any money really at that point besides you know the ingredients and a few bottles right so it would have been very easy to just be like yeah you know what screw this isn't for me uh, i love that we're gonna have to have uh beer when we do round two in person <laughs> yeah you know the funny thing too is like people assume that like like so this isn't bad it was like a normal assumption but like anytime now if i go out with anybody they're like oh you're gonna get beer or if i order anything that's not beer uh, they're like oh you don't like beer anymore and i'm like just because i have like a beer company does not mean i'm only gonna drink beer um, you're never allowed to drink wine now exactly that's like i got that reaction from a couple of people and then 
the other thing too that people I, I think assume is like, oh man, you must like be drinking a whole lot of beer and stuff. And I'm like, I probably drink less after starting a brewing company. <laughs> Not because it's like bad, but it's like, uh, one, I'm like a lot, especially if I'm drinking beer, I'm like a lot, like I purposely am like a lot more picky now because one, it's a good excuse not to drink. Uh, if you like, you're like, oh, I just don't have anything good in the fridge right now. Okay, cool. I'm not going to drink. Um, but then it's also like, like, I just also find that like, because I'm doing a company and also on this full-time kind of consulting gig as well, I just like can't afford the hangover most of the time. <laughs> yeah so definitely. i'm just like yeah i'm just not gonna drink so i just like i don't know i found that like ever since doing this um and you know it wasn't like a conscious thing it's just something i realized uh was happening a few weeks ago i was like it's like yeah i'm probably like only drinking like maybe half of what i was when i was a lot less busy it's just like something about being busy that just like you're like, yeah I don't yeah i can't afford it yeah um that said we're, that said we're definitely having like beer or wine or whatever when uh, yeah, we're, in person. we're gonna have the we're gonna have the Lebanese one. <laughs> yeah, I gotta figure out where we can get them. Yeah, we'll we'll tweet uh, out. To him, be like, <laughs> <laughs> like when you're in DC, where do you get your uh, your Lebanese wine? And he'll probably say, "I'm never in DC." Yeah, <laughs> and he'll probably too, too insult close us. To politicians. He'll probably insult us in some way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, okay, so maybe I already know the answer to this, but if you could give one book to all the incoming freshmen of your college, what would it be? Oh my God. This is a tough question. Actually, did you think it was going to be anti-fragile? I, I, no, I don't think you would start somebody on anti-fragile. No, I don't think so either. Um, yeah. Maybe Black Swan. Yeah, I think, but also, um, I find that book to be like very effective when someone thinks they know what the world is like. Um, mm -hmm. like at least that was when I read black Swan and my mind was kind of blown by it was like, cause I thought like you, you're so sure of your beliefs on one thing. Whereas, I mean, maybe some high school students are like that, but I, I don't know. I felt like I didn't know a ton about how the world worked when I was a freshman in college. And I was like somewhat aware of that. Oh, okay. Well, so I, I, I don't know. I think you're the outlier state. there. I think that okay. a lot of people probably come into college feeling like they have, I don't know. I feel like I came into college cocky and it took me a while to. <laughs> I can't realize how from like a personal expectation standpoint. I was like, yeah, I'm going to, you know, like do amazing. But, um, I think I got more sure of how the world worked during college. And then like, I, when I started reading about this kind of stuff, then I was like, that was after college. That was like the first year after college. And it definitely could have sort of shook that up. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, you don't really know what's going on. Um, so what book do you think you would recommend then? Uh, well lately I've been on team Seneca. I actually would probably give that book. Uh, yeah letters probably would give letters um i'm trying to think like is there another book that i would give i mean one that i got actually um so this was from my uh my boss at booze allen that one summer i was there uh, he gave me 48 laws of power actually and that opened up a whole bunch of like rabbit holes in my head as well um that's a, it's a tougher book though. I feel like it'd have to, it's be a hard right book to get person. through. Yeah. yeah. It would have to be for like the right person I would give them... during work. So like, uh, yeah, <laughs> I didn't have like anywhere to go. So I, it was like, man, this is... and also at that time was like the era when everyone blocked like Facebook and YouTube and everything at work. Oh um, yeah. Or at least maybe some big companies still do that. But yeah, I didn't have any like social things I could do during work. So I was like, ah, I guess I'll just read this. I'll just read. Um, I feel like maybe 50th law. Would be mm, a that, easier yeah as a, as a robert green starting point that's a good point yeah i went through the order of uh it was 48 laws then 50th and then 33 strategies then art of seduction and then uh, mastery yeah I, I think 50th is actually my favorite of his books it's the most accessible for sure yeah the other ones i've actually found so i found 48 laws actually to be really useful as a reference um mm -hmm. when you're facing like a particular issue like especially the internal politics side uh, so we didn't really get into that that much, but uh, I found it to be like if I'm confused by someone's actions or I'm like getting annoyed by something, um, it's even just a good reminder of like this is just kind of a game people are playing. Like it's not really like, you know, like they're not personally trying to like, you know, mess you up, but it's like they're playing a power game or something um, where it's like people are getting territorial and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I think actually like, so not 48 laws, uh, but probably letters would be would be there um yeah it's so readable too it's so readable and relatable that's the other thing yeah it, it could have been written 10 years ago yeah and 
as a pop Would psychology or something. Exactly. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, I'm trying to think. Uh, yeah, that's probably what I'd stick with right now because there's a whole bunch of there's a whole bunch of books that I feel like I really enjoyed after college because of college. Like, because, so so for example, like uh, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, um, I found that to be so helpful for me right after college because I was very much in this um, disillusionment with uh, engineering and, and science in general. Um, because of like, I didn't like how, how engineering was taught at CMU. Like I already, you know, we were talking about before labs and the, the theory part. So I just found it to be like, I don't know. I was like, this is not how a product would actually be designed or how you would think about like an actual object in the world. Um, and Zen and the art of motorcycle, motorcycle maintenance was probably like the right book at the right time. So for me, it was very powerful, but if I had read that before doing like an engineering program, I probably would have been like, eh, this is like kind of boring or like not really relevant to anything that I've seen. That's true. You have to get the right book at the right time. No, it's so important. It's so important. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's true for like a lot of books. Like that's why sometimes have you ever gone back and reread a book that you really liked? And then second time you were like, yeah, this is not as, as good. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it hasn't happened that much to me, but there was definitely a couple where I was like, yeah, this is not what I remembered it. Well, I think like I think this is a really good example for me was when I was in high school, I read Atlas Shrugged and that had a huge impact on me. But I'm pretty sure that if I went back and reread it now, I wouldn't like it nearly as much hmm. because it kind of was the first book that got me interested in reading like that and in philosophy in particular. Mm. And I was very kind of on the Ayn Rand bandwagon for a while. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, you know, off that now thankfully but i think it was like really good to have that for a period to like then transition into reading other things think about other things and so i still respect it as a book that had a huge impact on me but i right. don't think i would really get as much out of it if i read it now right i think that's a, a good point yeah it, and it's like yeah because it was the right book the right time of your personal life that was uh, and your development and stuff um, actually, another one I would say that's probably more relevant to high schoolers and like early college students or college students in general, Fight Club. Um, that book, like I, I didn't read it till after college, but it still blew my mind. <laughs> it's phenomenal. Oh, it's so good. Yeah, that was and a it, really powerful one. It does kind of expose a lot of the craziness of consumerism and competition Yep, and all of that in really approachable it, it's a book of philosophy in a lot of ways yeah i think so and but, it's told in a fiction uh fictional story which i mean i think i finished it in like four days or something like i've read it really yeah, quickly um yeah it's not too long either which is good so it's yeah it's a pretty accessible book actually i'd change it to that um for nice. if somebody was entering college because it, it like imagine if you started college with that sort of in the back of your head <laughs> like, yeah you would, would change all your decisions Exactly. It'd be like uh, Space Monkeys. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it would. I mean, it's just like it would. I mean, if you truly could read it and absorb it at that age, like you would. I mean, it, even if it didn't affect all your decisions, you would at least like it would be in the back of your head as you were thinking about different things, like which classes well, it's, to it's, take or. Maybe. It's kind of like you said before about how school and reading can give you a terminology to interpret the world with. Mm hmm. And sometimes even just the right character archetype can help you understand other people or your environment in new and helpful and interesting ways. Yeah, I think that's a, a really good way to think about it. Yeah. Um, so hmm. we're, we're actually going to move towards wrapping up. Here. Yep. Yeah, 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 sounds good. <laughs> we're, 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 bad at, we're bad at stopping talking to each other. <laughs> um, uh, is there any last thoughts or pieces of advice that you wanted to throw out there that we haven't talked about things that you know maybe you would have really benefited from hearing when you were a student i think like uh, a big one which i don't know how useful as advice this is but um just sort of like trusting the process a little bit uh, like a lot of times you just can't see where things are gonna end up or like where like what turns sort of the path is gonna is gonna take um because like yeah, I mean, as you, you've probably heard in this podcast, if you're still listening three hours later. <laughs> um, Prop, props to anyone who is yeah. still here with us. <laughs> like, 
we we should we should give out gifts for people who made it this long or something exactly yeah <laughs> yeah there should be there should be like a giveaway or something here to a see reward, if, yeah. how many people actually got this far maybe i'll maybe i'll splice it in after we'll see nat this is gonna be your most popular episode <laughs> <laughs> um no it's like uh, it, it's just like yeah you might not be able to see kind of where things are gonna end up like i mean my background is like none of the things could have been predicted and now i'm like pretty sure the next thing like i definitely can't predict what you know where that's going to go or what even next industry i'm going to get into um mm-hmm. so i'm like no idea right like and it's that's okay um that used to freak me out a lot it would be like people would be like uh you know seem to have their future so figured out like you know where they're going to be in five years or ten years or whatever and i would be like well nothing i've ever planned on doing ever really ends up being what i do and that's usually by choice and it's kind of terrifying but um it all kind of works out and uh like yeah just kind of like trust the process follow your curiosity um and yeah don't get like too worked up about what other people are doing just kind of do your own thing i think that's a great note to wrap up on so neil thank you so much obviously for coming and hanging out for these past three hours if people <laughs> Anytime, want... man. yeah if you tolerate we're... us talking for three hours ever again i would love to be back on <laughs> oh of course well, we're, we're gonna we're gonna do a round two over the lebanese wine when yes. we're in dc that's the anti-fragile episode i love it <laughs> exactly uh where can people find you assuming uh they're still with us at this point yeah um so i'm pretty easy to get in touch with um my website's probably the easiest place so if you just go to neilsony.com uh my first name is spelled n-e-i-l and then last name is s-o-n-i uh, mm-hmm. dot com and then they can contact me there uh, have kind of all that information on there and then um, I write there I trying to write a bit more um, but I haven't written on the blog for a couple months but that's going to change very very soon uh, and then yeah I mean Twitter, Twitter is a good one uh, the rail Neil s so uh, that's pretty simple and then uh, Instagram is the same exact as uh, same handle as, as Twitter um, nice. And yeah, I'll like I won't, I won't give my I won't give my LinkedIn <laughs> anything <laughs> because nobody wants to see that. Dear um, dear Mr. Sony, I would love to connect with you on LinkedIn. <laughs> yes. It's weird though, man. Like it's uh, LinkedIn's a good it, it's good for reaching a certain type of person that you're you know like from a sales oh, perspective. Yeah. But yeah, um, certain like if you're doing sales yeah. stuff, big company, it's great. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, I'm. I'd rather people connect with me elsewhere, but that's fine. Um, yeah, so that's uh, pretty good. And people can reach out to me uh, with any questions. Like I'm usually pretty responsive on email. I sometimes delay responding by a couple of days if I'm in the middle of some things, but um, I will get back to you. Uh, and my email is really, really easy. So Neil, uh, N-E-I-L at neilsony.com. Nice. Well, hopefully, hopefully we don't make you regret giving away that email address. <laughs> it's on my site for now. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow okay that's, uh, that's a bold move yeah it's uh we'll see we'll see how long that lasts uh, i mean so far so good but that's probably because um most of the people i send to that site are good people but maybe we'll see if your listeners are any different than that <laughs> <laughs> you guys are going to subscribe me to all sorts of garbage <laughs> oh man well, it's, i'm sure it'll be better than some of the inbound i get from the articles on my site <laughs> Which you have to do an episode about that one day. <laughs> oh God! Love yeah, the, the questions that you get on your blog—that would be. I, I should just read off some of those emails and things. Dude, you should do the uh, the Jocko like Q and A thing, <laughs> like, <laughs> half of an episode. But just just, just joke Q and A of strange people and like <laughs> for some reason mostly in the Middle East and India asking me <laughs> like how they can make their penis bigger. Oh my so, God. <laughs> I get at least one of those a week. And is it? It's like actual people, though, right? It's not spam. Yeah, no, it's no, no, it's real people. Are they? And they're looking for like an actual answer from you. Yes. And do you have something you can you tell them? <laughs> do you want to share that on your podcast? No. I I do not have an answer for them though. <laughs> that's man. That's as uh, far as I can find. There is no solution. <laughs> they just have to live with it. But um, they just have to, yeah. Yeah, no, is that, well, I'm sure you get like, uh, you have a whole bunch of other kind of articles too. I feel like you'd get. Oh yeah. Stuff, but. Like, well, I mean that, that, that was how this started was that the most popular kind of inbound that wasn't about, you know, penis extension was <laughs> college students who weren't super excited about the process and wanted to 
go do other things and like you know they saw some of the stuff that i had written about and other people's in the scene and they were kind of asking like hey you know how do i not do the college path like that's how this whole thing started actually on that note that reminded me of one other thing if you can splice this in uh, do it so oh, we're, we're not we're not cutting any of this this is all going to be oh it. awesome okay even better yeah. <laughs> yeah you're like i'm not gonna take time to edit three hours and 15 minutes of audio <laughs> well, no, these, these last like people who are around here at this point like we're, we're all having fun now exactly so. exactly what was the last thing um so the last thing was just like if at any point in the conversation like nat or i gave the impression that we have it all figured out like that was not the intention we're definitely figuring this out as we go also uh, so anybody who's like thinking about like, you know, college or, or, you know, early grad life or anything like that. Like if at any point it sounds like, oh yeah, Neil's got it all figured out. No, I'm like still learning on the job here. I'm, uh, and I, I think it's going to stay that way till, <laughs> till I die. So, um, yeah. on that morbid stoic note, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like we're, we're all but just hey, figuring if, it out. As long as we're all having fun figuring exactly. it out. Exactly. Right? That's exactly it. The, the fun, I mean, the fun is really in the journey. So well, yeah. it's not in the destination. I don't know who said that, but somebody somebody more important than me. That's a good saying. Yeah. <laughs> All right. On that last bit of wisdom, I think we'll actually call it a night here. Yep. Sounds good. Neil, thank you so much for joining me. And uh, yeah, I will see you online. And everyone, be sure to go check Neil out. We'll have links to everything in the show notes. And have a great morning, afternoon, evening, whatever time it is when you're listening to this. Sounds good. Thanks, Nat. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Nat Chat. If you enjoyed the podcast, please subscribe to Nat Chat in iTunes, Stitcher, Overcast, or wherever you get your podcasts. Second, if you're trying to take advantage of some of the information from this episode, be sure you check out the show notes at nataliason, N-A-T-E-L-I-A-S-O-N dot com slash podcast. And find a friend, because implementing a lot of this stuff is much easier if you have somebody to do it with. And finally, if you enjoyed this episode and you've been enjoying other episodes of the podcast, please leave it a review on iTunes, Stitcher, wherever you listen to your casts so that more people can find it. This is the best way for it to get some more exposure and to make sure that I can keep bringing these episodes to you. With that, thank you and have an awesome rest of your day.